okay, that's interesting. Oh, so it tells me. Oh, yes, it, 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 it's a, it's a, we are, we are, we are forced to let people know, and Zoom has an automatic way of letting. Yeah, I mean know. that's probably for the best. Yes. <laughs> Very good. How are you now? Good. Very good. Very good. Oh, hang on. Oh my days! What is that? I think the fire alarm is going off. In the worst case scenario. <laughs> oh, that's bad timing. So if you need to go, uh, there will be a replacement chair. Yeah, I can, I can yeah. stay there, Kai, if you want. Uh, um, I think it's fine because the, it's another bit of the building that's alarming, so I don't think I have to evacuate, <laughs> but, but there is a fire alarm going off. And we do not have any test schedule, so. Okay. Okay, so I think, um, thank you. Uh, let me just say a few words to conclude the past session. So I would like to thank all the micro talk speakers. Uh, we are aware that there's short time for discussions and the format will continue improving in the, the next uh, editions, let's say. And um, we will soon start uh, a mini symposium session on channel one, which is the channel you're now watching. There is a, a concurrent session on channel two as well um, that has that will also start uh, in a few minutes time at 3 p.m. sharp. And uh, from now on, I'll uh, let Kyle chair the session and uh, interact with the other speakers. Excellent. Kyle, uh, it's uh, all yours. And so, Daniele, do you want me to start now or are we starting at... I think you start sharp on the hour. Sharp on the hour, great, okay, perfect. Okay, so um, shall we just check? So Anna, you're first. So maybe if you just wanna check that you can um, uh, share your screen and presentation. Sure. Okay. You should um, see a white background. Yes, it's uh, <laughs> a very informative first slide. <laughs> then maybe let's just try advancing one so that we can uh, just check this works. I'm sure it will do. Did you advance the slide, Alan, or is it just? I did advance the slide. You, you ah. see, you, you I still see. see a, I still see a white screen. Really? Yeah. Do you have? Do you have a, a dual monitor set up? Yeah. Because sometimes I think there are problems with this. Never had a problem before. Let's try that again. Share screen. Okay, no. so now I can see a slide with some very colorful dots on it that look like a brain. What uh, about this? Do you see the next slide? No. Oh, that's, no. that's amusing. So maybe if I try to Let's you try to mirror your screen, maybe. Yeah, I'll try to, to share the whole screen rather than the, uh, the stop one. Share. How about now? Okay, now it works. Okay, good. Perfect. Great. Okay, perfect. Okay, so you can, let's, should we just very quickly make sure that <laughs> there are no other issues? So, so Danny, do you want to try the same thing? No problem. So just share my screen, I suppose. Just share your screen and just check that the slide advances. Okay. Yes, just very boring technological admin. Yes. Okay, advance. Yeah, perfect. And then Michael, do you want to do the same? Yeah, no problem. You just start sharing. Um. Okay. Hopefully, you should see a couple of uh, brain networks. <laughs> I cannot see anything at the minute. Oh no! Oh, hang on. Okay. Uh, hopefully now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's good. Perfect. Um, uh, and if I advance, uh, no, it has not advanced. Okay. I can see you. Okay, now, now it has. You should have seen FX appear. An FX has just appeared in a box. Yeah, okay, perfect. perfect. I, th I think it's working. 
Yeah, it's great. just okay. it's just my my te technological skills. I think <laughs> letting me down. Good. Okay. Well, it looks like everything is working then. So so we're set. Yeah. Very good. And then yeah, when Itamar arrives, we'll just uh, <laughs> just have to hope that his works out of the box. This is quite funky, Alan. How did you draw this this network? Oh, that's uh, in Mathematica. That's the... Oh, okay. Yeah, that's very nice. Uh, all right. Uh, okay, so I make that 2 p.m. Uh, British summer time, which must mean it's 3 p.m. Uh, European summer time. So it means we can get going. So um, welcome all to this uh, mini symposium, which is on uh, broadly uh, dynamical transitions in heterogeneous and structurally anisotropic neural networks. So I'd like to begin by extending my gratitude to the conference organizers for what's been a fantastic meeting thus far. Uh, and I'm sure will be for, well, hope will be for this last session and the plenary afterwards. Um, it's great that we can still have these meetings virtually, if not in person, although I'd be lying if I said I wasn't looking forward to go spending some time in the south of France. Um, so just to I just say a few opening remarks about the rationale for this mini symposium. So obviously over the history of uh, neural network dynamics, there's been lots of really interesting studies uh, about sort of network architectures, coupling and dynamics um, some of which we've seen already in this meeting. I think Michael organized a session on, on mean field dynamics. Uh, and a lot of these kind of approaches have assumed certain things about the way that um, the, the networks within the brain or in similar systems are organized. And so the rationale behind this mini symposium is to go to push that slightly further. So to relax the assumptions that you have very typified structures like global coupling or uh, erdos Schrenny type coupling networks. And in particular, to push them into something more biologically constrained. So I think all of the speakers who are going to be talking today have networks that are either directly taken from data or are at least inspired uh, by the biological system that they're trying to model. So very much looking forward to uh, the session. A few opening, uh, well, a few admin and housekeeping rules. So speakers, please do keep to time. So that's uh, sort of 25 minutes and a few minutes for questions. Uh, for people in the audience, uh, whether that be on Zoom or whether in YouTube, please feel free to ask questions via the chat. So there is a chat in the Zoom session. There's also a chat feature in YouTube. Uh, I understand that Daniele will be monitoring the chats and uh, will feed questions uh, from there to the speakers. So uh, it's, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the mini symposium, which is Alan Gorelli at the University of Oxford. And he is gonna be talking to us about network, network dysfunction in neurodegenerative diseases. So Alan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kyle, and uh, thank you kindly for the invitation to be part of your symposium. I, I haven't been able to uh, watch all the talks well late at night, but uh, so far it's been very impressive. So uh, I'll be talking about aspect of structure and function in uh, related to neurodegenerative disease and network, as the title uh, suggests. So this is uh, work principally uh, by uh, Christopher Alexanderson, who is doing his uh, uh, PhD now in Oxford, supervised by myself and Christian Bick, with, with many people around know uh, Christian. Uh, and it's based on previous work that Christian and I uh, started uh, a couple of years ago. But it's also based for the, the background for the disease propagation on more recent work by, uh, from our group, and mostly by Travis Thompson, who is a, a, a postdoc, and uh, Pavan Shagar, who is a, a, a PhD student. And I, I realized that you all are soon going to be uh, looking for a new home as a journal. So I, I want to suggest that Brain Multiphysics is a perfectly uh, fine home. It's a new open access journal that uh, we started a few years ago to look more about the physical aspect uh, of the brain or related physical aspect to functional aspect. Uh, if you have any papers that you think might be a good fit, just email me and we can enter a discussion. It very, it's very much uh, a, a personalized experience, not, a, not just website and all that. Just email me. 
Okay, so let me start. Uh, I'm going to talk about neurodegenerative disease. I'm not going to give you, of course, a, a full picture of that. I assume that you know the basis. What I want to uh, highlight is that there are many different aspects of the disease. The best known one are the biochemical aspect. It's the basis of all uh, possible treatment or, or therapeutics that have been, or, or drugs that have been proposed. And it's the idea that the, what underlies the, underlies the disease is um, uh, toxic proteins. In the case of Alzheimer's disease, I'm mostly gonna talk about Alzheimer's. A lot of the, the things I'm gonna talk about apply to other dis disease, but let's, let's focus on Alzheimer, who is the main cause for dementia. Uh, it's well known the hallmark of the disease, uh, the characteristic uh, aggregation accumulation of two types of toxic protein, amyloid beta, which is extracellular, and tau, uh, in, and tau inclusion, makes neurofibrillary tangles, that and tau is an intracellular protein. And it's the interaction between these two and the damage that they create into the, into the brain that creates dementia. So apart from the biochemical aspect of the aggregation of these protein, there is a pathophysiological aspect which is related to cell death and ultimately atrophy. For instance, in this MRI, you see from within three years of evolution of the disease, you see a big loss of tissue, uh, mostly, uh, mostly in the gray area and so on. So there is a whole physiological aspect. So it has a direct implication on the physiology of the, of, of the brain function. And also as uh, uh, for interest for this session on functional aspect. And I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about what is known, but of, uh, for, for many years now, people have tried to extract from EEG and MEG some type of biomarker that are related to a cognitive impairment. And of course, past the functional aspect, there is also directly the behavioral aspect, which are the series of cognitive impairment that come with the progression of dementia. And here is a very poignant uh, uh, picture of it, which is a self-portrait by an artist, William Hutton Mullen, who, had, who was diagnosed in 96 with uh, Alzheimer's disease and chronicle the progression of the disease through his painting. And you see an advanced stage in three years later, this is another self-portrait. And you can see all the, all, all the behavioral problems that are associated with the disease in his painting or the way, the way he can, he's trying to represent himself. So there are different markers that are associated with ease of this, uh, uh, as, this aspect of the disease. Uh, there is, you can try directly to look at the content of this protein, or the concentration of this toxic protein, either through the CSF or through PET, uh, PET analysis, PET imaging for both tau and amyloid beta. The, on the pathophysiology, you can do also uh, some time of PET to look at the metabolism, the way the metabolism work locally, but also MRI to look at uh, atrophy, just like I show you. Now on the functional aspect, uh, it's all about EEG and MEG, which as you can imagine, are much easier to perform than, than these guys, than, than other type of imaging techniques. Um, and finally, of course, you have a behavioral aspect which are related to cognitive tests. So the typical way uh, people think about the disease clinically and all that is a progression that mostly look like an evolution of a sigmoid curve. These are called Jack's curve. They're not come from a model. I was to my surprise when I first looked at the problem. I thought these were the result of a model. They're just drawn on a piece of paper. And that's what, what uh, uh, in clinical setting they call a model. Um, but the idea is the following, is that you have a series of evolution of biomarker that you can track. And the first thing you'll see typically would be a deposit of uh, amyloid beta, followed by tau, tau would be apparent, and then the MRI, and then the cognitive impairment. And you see from this picture, uh, EEG and MEG is not part of that. It's not used yet as a biomarker, despite, despite uh, many studies related to that. So. The, the big picture, the, the, the purpose of the talk is trying to see if we can uh, link the biochemical progression of the disease, progression spatial temporal dynamics of the disease in terms of toxic protein to the damage it causes, and then eventually to the functional aspect. And this is summarized in a recent uh, review uh, in Neuron about a year ago, part of the open question. And I just want to, to read you the, the last open question. How can the direct action of uh, uh, 
Alzheimer's disease related peptides, these the peptides are these uh, toxic protein, be leveraged to understand neurodegeneration and dementia that appear later in the disease. More specifically, how can we connect the dots from peptide to circuits to neurodegeneration and or dementia? So this is what we're going to attempt to do at a theoretical level, it's really connect the dots. So what do we know about uh, functional aspect of people with uh, uh, mild cognitive impairment or, or Alzheimer's disease? There are about a few hundred uh, uh, studies that look at multiple aspects with at least, I don't know, there is a kind of systematic reviews, you know, that they do. And there are at least about a hundred different type of uh, quantities that the people have tried to extract for, uh, for, for uh, to try to, to try to identify and classify uh, the signature of, uh, of Alzheimer's disease through uh, functional analysis to the oscillatory dynamics. But uh, it's, it's, it's a bit controversial, but yet there are certain aspects that are very clear that appear, especially in the rest state uh, analysis. Uh, in, of course, as you know, probably in rest states, it's mostly uh, the activity of the brain is mostly in the alpha band. And what is seen is that you have an initial hyperactivity for mild cognitive impairment with respect to a healthy a patient that's followed by hypoactivity. And you can see here by the power spectrum, for its power spectrum density, that you have a drop in the power spectrum density from hyperactivity to hypoactivity. That's the first, the first thing that's more or less well established. And the second one is that if you look at the peak of frequency, you have a shift to lower frequency, you have a slowing down of, of the oscillation. And I always find that extremely bizarre because if you think about the brain being systematically damaged, you think that overall what you have is a slow decay of all activity. And when you talk to people, they always say, oh yes, it's homeostasis, the brain, the brain sees that there is a uh, some kind of deficiency and overreact and that's why hyperactivity. And I'm not quite satisfied with that because there is not quite um, a dedicated mechanism really to explain that. Of course, there is a lot of homeostatic response in the brain that try to normalize, but which one there? It's, it's, for me, it was not quite an explanation. So as far as the big picture is concerned, what we're trying to do at the theoretical level is uh, we're going first to develop, or I'm gonna show you a progress that we've made in the last few years in terms of model for protein, uh, toxic protein aggregation and, uh, and progression within the brain. So at the local level, we look at both the propagation of amyloid beta and the tau protein and their interaction. And we're going to map that on a network on the brain based on uh, data-driven uh, structural connectome based on a weight matrix, uh, uh, the adjacency matrix, but it's a weighted adjacency matrix for the transport. We're going to use the graph Laplacian as the basic transport. Now, these proteins are going to create damage. So we're going to have a damage model. The damage is going to affect the edge of T, so you affect the weight because transport, transport is, is, uh, uh, is affected by, by the disease. But also at the local level, it's going to affect differently the two, uh, the two population of neuron. And we're gonna use a neuronal mass model, both with an excitatory and an inhibitory uh, population. And I'll go into detail of how how this interaction occurs. So I wanna take it one step at a time. I'm going to start with the uh, propagation model, then quickly the damage model and the new, or it affects the neuronal mass model. So the basic idea of the propagation uh, model, there are different way you can do it, but here is a, I think a, a, good, a, a good balance between overly complicated and being realistic. The idea is that you have a, both a healthy, a healthy population and a toxic population in red, and that you have an autocatalytic expansion of the toxic, uh, the toxic population through uh, replication and conversion of the healthy and healthy uh, protein into a toxic one, followed by fragmentation. So the overall con conversion is you start with red and blue and you end up with two red. So you start with P plus P tilde, tilde for toxic, and with a rate K12, you produce two, two, P, two P tilde. So now you can put that on the brain, on the connectome, and define at each node I uh, a PI. 
um, and uh, really look at a simple type uh, discretization of reaction diffusion equation where you have propagation term, clearance term, because you have normal clearance of both healthy and toxic protein, and a conversion between the two. And so you can run that on whatever model do you have. Uh, and what we're going to use is we have, we have connectome taken from uh, uh, data that we average over 400 different patients of uh, a different resolution, all the way down to 83 nodes and all the way up to about a thousand nodes with different resolution for that. And we use uh, for the transport process, uh, Laplacian transport that's uh, directly taken from the weight and the weight is taken as the number of, of axonal fiber between two regions of interest divided by the length. So you also have a notion of time evolution in the process or, or at least the distance of propagation. And what you get when you, when you apply this idea is that you get very much the same type of curve as Jack's curve. Now I just wanna show you these are for different disease, but the one of interest for us is the amyloid beta that you see early on. And the, the blue one here is the toe one that follows after. So these are propagation of individual toxic protein. And uh, a year ago, about now two years ago, uh, we started looking at the interaction between amyloid beta and the tau protein because we believe they are important uh, for this picture. And the interaction within amyloid beta and tau protein is interesting. The presence of amyloid beta will further enhance the uh, activity of the, the toxic protein, enhance the toxic protein. So we have two models, you know, two of these heterodimer models that are coupled with uh, a term of interaction. I'm not going to show you equation, but I show you what the effect is. For instance, you run them on this on a line of amyloid beta here in blue and tau protein in, in red. And as they come in contact, the, the amyloid beta front is not affected, but the tau protein front is uh, enhanced. That's all, of course, what happens locally. And then you can pour that to the entire uh, connectome. And now we have dedicated uh, tools to uh, make this uh, simulation more or less automatic and, and extremely fast. Uh, I mean, as usual, visualization takes much longer, but they run within seconds or minute, even in the biggest, in the biggest connectome. And we've optimized these so that now you can do a Bayesian inference for a parameter validation and parameter estimation. So what you see on the left is amyloid beta propagating, tau protein starting on the, on the right. These are not, uh, these are not realistic initial condition, but it's just to show you what happens when the tau protein gets in contact with the amyloid beta, you have a sudden increase, you have further increase of the, uh, of the invasion. Okay, so now we can move to uh, the network damage. We know to look at the evolution of this protein on the brain, and we want to uh, see how it's affected. So what we consider are two different uh, field variables, one for the damage due to uh, uh, amyloid beta and one due to protein. There are a lot of different putative mechanisms on which or they act locally on, on cell and on tissue. So it's good to keep track of the two, but as far as the network is concerned, an edge will be affected by a combination, a linear combination of both damage. So these two damage variables are just number between zero and one, like in, in typical damage theory. And what we do is that we run the concentration, and at each node you define a damage variable that would increase between zero and one uh, uh, as a function of the concentration. So it integrates the concentration and saturate and saturate to one. So, and based on that, we look at the weight evolution as uh, a decaying exponential of the weight of the damage of how much damage there is between two nodes. We, we integrate that. Now, the damage, of course, since it's uh, changed uh, W, it changed the transport and it affects the transport. But even in the case where you have huge damage, where you tweak the parameter to have huge damage, so very quick fall in the weight, you see that the change in, in concentration is very slow, very small. So it tells you that the feedback, the, the, the damage of the network does not really change the propagation of the disease itself, at most by a year, even in the most extreme situation. Uh, and that, that's more or less normal because we know that as soon as the disease is seeded, 
even if you remove the way the transport uh, process, the, you still have a, a, a local increase, just like we had with COVID. When we, we stopped flying from places to place, the disease was seen at everywhere and increased. At that place, the transport, the, 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 the effect of the transport becomes negligible. So now what you can do once you have that is that, let's say that it's a line of 30 years and you can look at the connectome, the structural connectome and how it's affected and look at the rest state and run a functional model on this with this evolving connectome uh, for each year. You run it for a few uh, physical seconds, if you want, uh, to see how it affects, affects the, uh, the rest state uh, response. And in order to do that, you need a neuronal mass model. So I want to show you is uh, the simplest one that we could think of, which is really a, a, a good toy model that capture all, all the, the process that we want. So it's a half model where Z is a complex variable at each node for which we assume that we have a half bifurcation. We are just below the half bifurcation that's around 10 uh, Hertz. We have a sigmoid response that depends on the weight, so that's the interaction and possible delays. Now, the important part for this modeling process is that we, the response of the excitatory and inhibitory population is different uh, because of the damage done by the amyloid beta. So the half bifurcation contain explicitly the inhibitory and the excitatory population as the imaginary and the, and, and the uh, real part of the process. And A and B change the typical half bifurcation, which is uh, an amplitude that in the Z space is a circle into an ellipse and A and B are the uh, semi-axis of the ellipse. So A and B control the amplitude of each population. Now, from what we know, there are different studies and different mechanisms that have been identified that shows that the presence of amyloid beta damage due to amyloid beta and has a, a positive effect on the excitatory population, but inhibits the inhibitory population. Similarly, the presence of tau inhibits the excitatory population. And so we have a simple law that tells us that the maximum of these uh, response of these two population is bounded and depend on the damage parameter. So it's a very simple law with only a couple parameter. I think this is really the minimal model that capture the, uh, the type of response that we know from this system. Now the question we can, we can start asking the typical question, uh, whether or not what we see is mostly due to a local change at a region, it's a focal lesion if you want, or change that are structural due to the network. So it's typical in our field to think that everything is dynamics and that it's probably due to the change of the topology or the geometry of the underlying network. But a priori, there is not, nothing that would tell us that it's the case. So we can actually test that hypothesis by looking at the case where we have only axonal damage. So on the edge, just looking at these and removing this uh, interaction, the, the way the uh, uh, excitatory inhibitory population respond to the, the, the presence of amyloid beta and tau protein. We can do the opposite, just looking at neuronal damage, that's your undo, or both, a combination of both. And what we want to test is the basic qualitative uh, observation, the, uh, more or less the only one that people uh, agree on within the uh, alpha, alpha band is that we have an initial hyperactivity followed by hyperactivity and a shift to lower frequencies. So when you do that and you look only at axonal damage, so by looking at the progression and the reduction of, um, uh, of the weight of each edge, what you see is the absolute power goes down quite quickly to, uh, to zero. On arbitrary scale, you can think of that between uh, early onset of the disease to about 30 to 40 years down, down the road. You can rescale it. And this is not surprising because if you remove the edge, what you have is the oscillation of the uh, hop oscillator, but the up uh, bifurcation is taking below the bifurcation threshold. And so the, uh, they all go down to uh, a steady state in the absence of interaction because you are just below the bifurcation. And similarly, the, uh, we took this oscillator distributed around 10 Hertz and you have a reduction of the frequency due to the interaction, but these interaction disappear 
as the weight goes to zero, and then you go down, you go back to 10 Hertz. So you do not have uh, hyperactivity and you do not have a, a slowdown just due to axonal damage. So it tells you probably with the, I mean, the model is sufficiently simple that whatever you do with a more complicated model is not going to have. Axonal damage by itself is not sufficient to explain uh, these, two, these two facts. Now, if we look at both neuronal and axonal damage together, say, okay, now we have to add, add this component, you'll see that it becomes much more interesting. We still have the fact that the frequency in, uh, uh, increase, and that's completely normal because eventually all the, all the edges are removed, so you expect that, and the same here, but you have a transient dynamics where you start to have hyperactivity. And what's also interesting is that it's very different in different regions, and that's what we want, that, uh, that's what we expect, because we know that different regions in the brain will experience different type of hyper and hyperactivity at different times. So that's very precious to have this information. So we have the right behavior here, starting hypo, hyperactivity, and going back down, but we still have not have the right. So the last possibility, if we only look at neuronal damage and say, well, the, the, the damage due to the white part, to the edge, it's really something that comes very late in the disease. Essentially, the network more or less maintain its function. It's not like you actually go and cut fibers and all that. And that's, that, that picture is more or less correct because that's when you, you talk to, 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 to a specialist in this field, they'll tell you that they don't see much damage in the actual connection. Uh, they do see it, but very late in the disease. And here, what you see is indeed uh, I, normal activity uh, then hyperactivity followed by hypoactivity. And uh, you see it much more uh, emphasized in the parietal lobes, the one I show you with, it's, uh, it's also uh, much, uh, much more apparent, just like uh, uh, in, 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 our, in our simulation. And that's really due to the seeding effect of the tau protein propagating uh, within, within the brain. And surprisingly, and I'm not sure, I, I don't understand that mathematically, I don't know why there is only that trend that is seen, but we do see a uh, slowing down of the frequency also uh, in the process. Uh, it's something that, something interesting, I think that, that we can explore on even simpler model, uh, really to understand the, the relationship between the, the shift in frequency and the property of this oscillator based on this, on this network. So let me conclude. Um, so what I, I show you are very much preliminary result, but they, in a way they're quite exciting because we haven't, we haven't cheated or we haven't tried to cheat. Sometimes you try to cheat, but these results are consistent with, with the data or the basic observation. So I think they are a good basis for, for further study. Of course, we've been thinking from the get-go to uh, implement better neuronal mass model, um, uh, including the what we call the Nottingham model. Uh, it's called, it has a different name in, uh, in Nottingham, I believe. Um, and uh, other aspects that, 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 uh, that, that are interesting, uh, whether or not we can couple that with different frequency, because you see that the effect in different uh, range is also very important. But also, uh, which I think would be much more interesting is eventually, uh, the next step would be really to infer real functional deficiency, uh, for instance, wakefulness and apathy out of the activity of these uh, oscillatory uh, dynamics on this network uh, and, and the way they are systematically um, uh, destroyed. Um, okay, thank you. That's it. Hope I'm on time. Uh, yeah, that's almost perfect. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, okay, we have a few minutes for questions. Um, does anyone want to lead us off? Uh, in which case, I have a, a couple of questions. Um, so, Alan, you mentioned right there at the end some using a different kind of neural mass model. Um, uh, so maybe you could, you could comment a little bit on that, in particular with respect to the fact that um, when you see these amyloid beta and tau pathologies, you very often see this aberrant um, theta gamma coupling, um, in, well, certainly in mice, I don't know how it is in humans. So of course, then this speaks much more to the synchronization, which at the moment is not in your neural mass model. So what do you expect to change if you put in uh, a more detailed neural mass model? Well, maybe it's a question I have for the community because I'm really I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm no expert. But so far, I've seen that uh, I mean, this, typically, these neuronal mass model are good at in a in a given range of frequency, uh, but not so much across a different range of the way the the different frequency interact. 
and I think I think that's uh, that's something that I wanted to see whether whether it exists uh, independently. Uh, uh, and it's true that uh, so the other aspect of you um, of your question is or if or the way I I, I read it is what are the best marker for um, for function uh, like like uh, synchronicity of of, of of oscillator? What does that correspond in terms? Of, of function. And so there are a lot of different, as, as you know, there are a lot of different possible uh, markers for that. You, you can talk about entropy, you can talk about uh, synchronicity, uh, uh, there, there are different markers. And I, I really don't know which, which are the best one uh, uh, in terms of relation to actual uh, deficiency in behavior. Uh, that's something I'd, I'd like to understand better. Um, I, I, the other day, I I, uh, I watched a very nice talk of uh, Fougeras, and uh, he, he had the same question. In a way. He, want, he wanted to talk about consciousness, but he said we need to wa- we need to have some way to describe wakefulness, which is exactly what you would like to do in dementia. Forget about consciousness. You just want to know if a patient is able to capture uh, uh, to be to be awake and aware of of the surrounding. You know, because apathy is really something that is a typical feature of the disease. So, in terms of oscillator dynamics, I can run oscillator, I can run neuronal mass model, I can vary parameter depending on the disease. But out of the signal, which marker, what combination of the signal do I need in order to relate that to that particular uh, behavior, lack of behavior? That I don't know. And if you know. And I think that it's a, it's it's a wonderful question, and if we can answer it, we can really make progress into really, as uh, as the review said, connecting the dots. Great stuff, brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, I think it's probably best that we move on, as it's now half past the hour. So I'd like to invite uh, the next speaker, who is Daniel Galvis, to share his presentation. So Daniel is at the University of Birmingham. I'll just give him a moment to. Okay, screen setter. Brilliant. And, and he will be talking to us about the effects of spatial non uniformity of heterogeneous excitable bursters on coordinated activity in a diffusively coupled lattice. Danny, please, you have the floor. Okay, hello. Um, thank you for coming to my talk and uh, welcome to my flat. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about this uh, spatial non uniformity in these bursting networks. Uh, but first, I would like to uh, thank my collaborators. So uh, I work at the University of Birmingham and uh, the medical school. Uh, I work at the uh, Institute of Metabolism and Systems Research where I work with uh, Professor David Hodson who is a uh, experimentalist. His focus is on uh, beta cell networks which are pancreatic insulin secreting uh, cells and and its relationship to diabetes. I also work with a quantitative group, uh, the Center for Systems Modeling and Quantitative Biomedicine, uh, where I work with John Terry and Isabella uh, and Carol Breen, and as well uh, at the University of Exeter with uh, with Kyle Wedgwood. Um, and I couldn't uh, have done this work without them, so many thanks. Um, okay, so the first, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the motivation for this problem, which is a biological motivation. I'll talk about the, the mathematical model we're going to look at of single cells uh, and the heterogeneity that we want to include in these single cell uh, models. And then we will couple them into a network and study the uh, spatial non-uniformity of that network. Okay, so the motivation for this work comes from uh, the pancreas actually. So it's not uh, specifically a neuroscientific question. And the pancreas is uh, among other things responsible for uh, maintaining glucose homeostasis uh, throughout the body. So it contains these uh, populations, these networks of electrically excitable and diffusively coupled cells called uh, beta cells, uh, which take in glucose and convert it into ATP. And that ATP will close uh, some potassium channels that activate the cells electrically and they begin to uh, burst. And this burst, these bursts will um, increase the the intrinsic levels of calcium within the cells, which causes insulin secretion. And they do this in a highly uh, synchronized and coordinated manner. Um, And so I have a couple images here. So on the, on the right, you can see, uh, some staining for uh, beta cell networks within uh, a pancreatic islet. And there's, there's different markers for them. So insulin is the one that's 
uh, is most clear. So that's the actual um, glucose regulating hormone. Uh, and then also uh, what you can see in the bottom left is, is for example, the, the calcium activity of an islet, which is a good readout for the insulin secretion of an islet. And so at the top, you have the average over the whole islet. And then below that, we have um, 88 or so recorded cells. And you can kind of see this high level of synchronization uh, of the calcium dynamics. And for a long time, uh, the way this has been studied uh, due to technological constraints, as well as, uh, as well as the way these things are coupled with these diffusive coupling, um, it was thought that you could kind of just look at the average over the whole islet and, and consider what that's doing over time. And so the mathematical models of a beta cell were kind of tuned to the activity of a full islet. And this, uh, this led to many, many very important uh, studies and findings. Uh, however, more recently, um, there have been uh, several experiments using multicellular calcium imaging. So this is looking at the calcium activity of single beta cells and groups of single beta cells within an islet, and as well, uh, the ability to genetically manipulate or excite or inhibit single cells or single or target single cells or groups of single cells within the islet. Um, has made a lot of progress uh, recently. And so what's been found uh, to a high uh, degree is actually that while these things do synchronize, um, heterogeneity in function and heterogeneity in the genetic profiles of the cells within the islets uh, is actually crucial um, to the proper functioning of the islet. And so uh, we're going to take a look at one example, and, uh, and this will be the direct motivation for what, uh, what I've been working on. So in this experiment, what they were doing was they were looking at a cross section of an islet. You can see that in the experimental image. And what they were doing was they were looking at all of the cells. So they're doing multicellular um, calcium imaging again. And what they found is that, it was, so they looked at individual cells and they also looked at the quadrants of the, um, of the cross section of the islet. So the four quadrants. And what they found was that the different quadrants displayed different levels of metabolic activity. So that's how much um, ATP is produced in response to glucose. And this can be thought of as a proxy for excitability as well in the cells. And what they found was the different quadrants had uh, different levels of metabolic activity. And this was actually related to, um, in a sense, how much they control the islet. So what they would do is excite these quadrants or excite these single cells and then see to what extent the rest of the islet was actually excited. So in some cases they would excite a quadrant and the whole islet would be excited or in other cases they excite a quadrant and only a small portion of the islet is excited. And then, uh, and so this was all experimental work but they also put this into a mathematical model which you can see on the right uh, where they took a spherical shaped islet and they took um, four sections of the islet and gave them variable uh, metabolic activity. So this was a, a, a each individual node was a beta cell model. Um, and then they found that they were able to reproduce some of the experimental findings. Uh, and it was very interesting. Uh, but the reason we wanted to kind of probe into this further is because this was uh, kind of a very narrow study. So it really only works uh, given the experimental constraints. And, and additionally, um, the idea that actually what's happening is that we have four separate subpopulations of cells in the four corners of the islet uh, was never actually um, what anyone really expected to see. And so what, what I was trying to do was look at this spatial non-uniformity and try to do it in a more generalized way uh, with, a, with a beta cell model, but a, a simpler uh, beta cell model that's really just a model of a, of a bursting cell. Okay, so the, the mathematical model for a single cell we're gonna use is an early conductance-based model of the pancreatic beta cell. It's a, it's a lot like a Hodgkin-Huxley uh, type formulation. So it's got uh, fast hyperpolarizing potassium channels and calcium channels, which lead to uh, the calcium channels depolarizing. And these uh, cause the fast spikes. So this is similar to the um, sodium and potassium in the Hodgkin-Huxley model, but it also has uh, 
calcium dependent potassium channels, which uh, will lead to bursting. So these things are, are, so calcium slowly builds up within the cell, which opens up these hyperpolarizing potassium channels and leads to termination of bursts. And so you have this bursting activity and that bursting activity is what leads to the uh, pulsatile insulin uh, secretion in islets. And then we also have some leak channels, which is going to set the excitability of the cells. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then also we have di diffusive coupling in this model. Okay. So in this, in this model, we're actually using a leak channel as a kind of simple proxy for these KATP channel, these, these hyperpolarizing ATP sensitive uh, channels. And the idea is that, that normally these, the mathematical models of these KATP channels would have an ATP uh, variable and ATP varies uh, really, really slowly, but it does change the dynamics somewhat of the model. Uh, but we thought uh, that for simplicity and because the dynamics are so slow, uh, what we could do is actually just have a leak channel and this single parameter G, which is essentially a fixed um, ATP or a fixed glucose value. And so um, this is going to set the network activation and it's a global parameter. So all the cells in a single network will have the same activation, the same glucose level you could think of it as. And then also uh, the, the max conductance of the leak channel is going to set the excitability. This will be a local parameter. So cells will have different values. And this is going to be one of the places we include heterogeneity. So the heterogeneity will be in cell excitability throughout the network. Uh, so here's just a, a simple example. So for G at some level of activation, this is kind of a high activation uh, for different leak. Um, values, uh, you can see the bursting. So for example, in red, this is kind of a very excitable cell. So it has a high mean calcium and a high uh, oscillation frequency. And then as, as G sub L increases, uh, as the leak current increases, what you see is lower mean calcium as well as slower oscillations. And then uh, for G sub L past some value, you reach a phase transition where you have just quiescence. And um, okay, and then we also have these these, these couple uh, coupled cells via gap junctions, which is just uh, some uh, max conductance of the of the uh, gap junction, and then it's uh, the it's the difference between uh, the voltages of the two of the two cells, and these things are symmetric. So if if cell I is connected to cell J, then cell J is connected to um, cell I, and we couple these in a network which has the following architecture. So it's a, it's a 3D, 3D network um, which uses hexagonal closed packing of equally sized spheres to form a lattice. So that's shown here on the bottom left. So here we have a central node and it has 12 nearest neighbors uh, and, and it shows all of their connections. So each node in the interior of the lattice will have 12 connections. Um, and then the full network, an example of a full network can be seen on the bottom right. Um, and it just forms a sort of sphere. So we embed the hexagonal lattice within a sphere of about a thousand oscillators, which is the um, the order of magnitude of the of a pancreatic islet. Um, okay, so heterogeneity and uh, spatial non-uniformity. So the way we're going to do uh, this uh, heterogeneity is we're going to consider two populations, and this is motivated more or less by um, the the islet studies, so the, the levels of more excitable and less excitable cells within the islet study. So we have a population one, which is about 10 to 20% of the islet, and it's more excitable. So these are at the levels of activation, network activation that we look at, these things are intrinsically active, you know, if they, if they don't have gap junction connections, whereas pop, uh, population two is less excitable. And within the network activation range that we look at, these would be um, intrinsically quiescent and then make up like 80 to 90% of the islets. And then we start with a spatially uniform distribution. So we just randomly plop down some, some of these blue population one cells throughout the, throughout the islet, but it's completely uh, uniformly distributed. And what we did was we generated an algorithm that could create uh, spatial uniformity. So here I've got five uh, examples where each column is an example of transitioning from complete spatial uniformity to uh, spatial non-uniformity. Um, and so we choose a, 
some different configurations of the spatially uniform network and we do some algorithm and over several iterations, uh, you can see, if, for example, in the second row, the things are starting to clump. Population one cells are starting to clump up and then they clump a little more in row three, row four, they're getting quite clustered. And then uh, at the end state, you generally have one large cluster or maybe two uh, and in some cases, three. And so the, um, so first I need to define uh, a measure of spatial assortativity, which is just going to be the measure of the tendency of members of the same population to be connected to one another. Um, and we're using the name spatial because the nodes are forming connections to their nearest neighbors. This is similar to the network science definition of assortativity, for example, degree assortativity, except that the preferential attachment is, is about an intrinsic property of the node rather than, for example, uh, checking how likely two nodes are with similar degrees to be connected to each other. So it's not a property of the, of the, of the network, uh, rather a property of the um, intrinsic uh, well, intrinsic properties of the node. And so uh, the way we define this then is we, we have sort of three separate definitions. Uh, the first node assortativity, which is just the fraction of connections uh, onto nodes from the same population. So here I've got population one in blue, population two in red. If we look at population one, node two, you can see it has three connections and two of them are onto population two. So the node assortativity for A sub two would be uh, one third. And then the population assortativity is the mean node assortativity across a single population. So population one will have its own assortativity and population two will have another assortativity. And then the network assortativity is the mean of all the population assortativities. And what this does is that it prevents um, biasing of the uh, of the assortativity based on the size of the population. So if, if we have one small population, they are sort of equally weighted in the assortativity um, measure. So then we have this algorithm, which I can only talk about the kind of bare bones. There are some other details that are pretty interesting, but uh, um, you know, if, if you're curious, uh, feel free to ask. And so basically we have and it, uh, on each iteration, we, what we do is we select a pair of nodes, one from each population. So in this case, for example, we could select uh, popula uh, population two, node one, and population uh, one, node three. And the question is, if, swap, if I swap them, uh, does this increase that network assortativity? And if it does, then I, uh, then I will accept the swap and I will move on to the next iteration. And if it doesn't increase this assortativity, then just re uh, reject the swap and try a different pair of nodes. And if all pairs are rejected, that means that no further improvements to spatial assortativity can be made. So we ter terminate the algorithm. So it'll be um, somewhere on the order of 300, 350 iterations for 10% population one until you reach that sort of clustered state that we saw earlier. So here's an example uh, over one of the networks, so starting from just some uniformly random distribution, what you can see is that one sort of large cluster appears to be forming in the center and the assortativity is, is a mon monotonically increases due to the way that we um, wrote the algorithm. And then in the final state, uh, what you have is a single cluster of, um, of cells sort of in the center and this is uh, the maximal spatial assortativity that you can have uh, given the, um, the initial condition and the ordering of, of the swaps that occurred. Uh, okay, so there we go. Okay, and so now we're going to put some network dynamics onto this, uh, onto these spatially non-uniform uh, networks and see what happens. Um, and just a reminder, so we have our global activation parameter G, which is in zero to one. Zero means the network should be fully inactive. One means that the network should be fully active. Uh, we have network assortativity, which is also um, in zero to one. Zero means uh, completely uniform random distribution of the two populations of cells. Uh, practically, this can only go to about 0 0.7 because one would actually mean uh, that you have two disjoint populations. Uh, and since all of, the, all of the cells will be connected to each other in one way or another, um, 
this is the max the sort of in practice maximum. Uh, we're also going to look at a various coupling strength. So uh, one, two, and 10 is just weak, um, some middling value, and then a strong coupling strength. And then we've got have our local parameter of node excitability uh, where population one is more excitable. Okay, so here's uh, just one example I'm gonna give where I'm looking at the, the network starting from the uniform random case and going to the clustered case. And what we're looking at on the right is various mean calcium uh, traces for different levels of activation. So the main important thing to remember is that the top panels are uh, higher network activation. So that could, you could think of that as more glucose, so more bursting. Um, and then the blue curve is the mean calcium of population one and the black curve is the mean calcium of population two. And then I just have 10, 10 traces. And at this point, they're all quiet, uh, even so, so you have actually no activity when things are uniformly distributed. But as we start to introduce non uh, uniform distributions, what you can see is that as this thing becomes more and more non-uniform, you start to see activation for lower and lower levels of G, of the network activation parameter. And so this thing becomes essentially more excitable, which perhaps makes sense as, as this population one um, cluster is the more excitable uh, population and they are sort of becoming uh, somewhat of a supercell. Okay. So this is another way uh, of looking at it. So what we're really interested in finding is, is phase transitions with respect to uh, this non-uniformity. So we have increasing the activation parameter G. Um, of course, this will lead to a phase transition um, as uh, when it's zero, it's always quiet. And when it's one, it will always have some activity. And at some point you'll go from a quiet system to a loud system. Uh, but what's interesting is as you increase the sortativity, but don't increase this network activation, you can also see uh, a phase transition. So for example, for low G, it takes a lot, a high degree of assortativity, uh, of spatial assortativity, whereas um, for higher values of G, it takes a lower uh, change in assortativity to get um, the phase transition. And so what we're gonna do is actually look at several different networks in assortativity and network activation space on a Latin hypercube, uh, run the dynamical system, and then assess the network measures uh, at each point. And the network measures we're gonna look at is the mean calcium peaks, which is the uh, average number of bursts over all the nodes. So this gives us an idea of the frequency of activity um, in the cell network. And then we're also going to use the Kuramoto order parameter to measure the synchronization of the islet or the, uh, or the cell network. Um, and just a quick reminder of the uh, Kuramoto uh, order parameter, what it is. So supposing you have uh, two time series, in this case, I'm using sine waves in the top left. Uh, over time, you can see um, that the values will change and sometimes these things will be close to each other other times uh, further. So what we do is a Hilbert transform and that gives you the top right where you have, and with sine waves, you just have two circles with the amplitude given by the amplitude of the sine waves. And the question is how synchronized are these? And so what we do is we, we project these onto the unit circle. So that's on the bottom left. And then we add together uh, the values in the complex plane of the two nodes that gives us a black dot and the, uh, the line pointing at the black dot represents uh, the Kuramoto order parameter. So you can see that when the two nodes are far away from each other on the unit circle, the value is small, but when they're close together, the value is large. And then we take the, um, so that value is all plotted over time on the bottom right, and we just take the average over all times, that's the black dotted line. And so this will be our measure of synchronization. Okay. Uh, and so we were looking at the three different coupling strengths and we have our, uh, you know, 2048 points uh, in G and assortativity. And here we're looking at the, uh, the number of peaks. Uh, so that is the average peaks over all of the um, cells in the network. And uh, all I wanted to say in this slide is that we're fitting, we're then fitting these to sigmoids and it's kind of the sigmoids that we'll look at. But what you can tell is that for very weak coupling, you have a sigmoid that is not very steep. 
Uh, whereas for stronger coupling, you have a very steep sigmoid. And so um, it might be easier to actually look at the, the half maxima of the sigmoids. And so those are drawn here as lines. Um, and what you can see is that for strong coupling strength, what you have is a half maxima that's, uh, that's high value in G, which implies that it takes a high value of network activation to get uh, this system going if the coupling is strong. However, the um, reliance on assortativity is also strong. So that's given by the slope of the line. So you can see that the slope is very steep and negative because um, as assortativity increases, uh, the, the required network activation is much lower. And this, a similar trend is also true for G coupling in the middle. Um, it does rely, well, assortativity does play a role as well, but it's less defined. And then when G uh, coupling is weak, you can see that the reliance on assortativity is, is, is much less. And um, so, oh, I should also mention that the thickness of these lines relates to the steepness. And so one interesting thing to, to keep in mind is that for the middle coupling value that we chose, uh, the steepness of the sigmoid is is quite a bit lower than it is uh, for G coupling equals 10. And that's gonna be, uh, I'm gonna mention that again in a second. So uh, with respect to the Kuramoto order parameter, we have very similar results. So for the strong coupling, uh, it takes a lot of, activation, uh, of G to activate the system, but the relationship between G and assortativity is also quite strong. Um, although, in the coupling case, the uh, relationship between G and assortativity for uh, middling coupling is also quite strong and um, and also perhaps a little bit stronger for the weak case as well. But one thing I wanted to point out as well here uh, is that what you'll notice for the middle um, coupling strength is that you is that the sigmoid is also very steep. So for, uh, for both the middle and the strong coupling strengths, you have a steep sigmoid. And so what that's kind of implying is that for strong coupling, you have a sort of all or nothing activity. Um, so either the network is completely quiet and nothing's going on, or everything is fully synchronized and oscillating at the sort of maximal frequency. Whereas for the middle case, uh, it's interesting, things do go from no synchronization, uh, well, no synchronization, no activity that is, uh, to full synchronization very quickly. However, uh, the actual frequency of the oscillations um, are much more, uh, well, are much less steep. So, so that's basically suggesting that for these middle coupling strengths, you have a, a stronger dynamic range, uh, which would be kind of a very important for the function of the islet, for example, where you really need to know how much glucose is coming in and be able to uh, secrete insulin at a rate that, that tracks that glucose level. Um, and here's just one other sort of final image, which is just showing the sigmoids as heat maps. And you can see that for this, the weak coupling, you have sort of a very fuzzy boundary between quiet and activity, and it's, it's less strongly related to assortativity. Whereas for the middling coupling, you have a very steep sigmoid and a pretty strong relationship between uh, assortativity and the activity of the network. And this is shifted up when you have stronger coupling as the network tends to say, to want to stay more quiet until uh, the activation is quite high. Okay, so a couple other things, uh, some conclusions. We developed this algorithm for introducing spatial non-uniformity into a diffusively coupled network of two populations in this case. Uh, for weak coupling, network activity is only weakly dependent on assortativity. But for middle and strong coupling, the network activity is strongly dependent on assortativity. And for the middle coupling, uh, the number of calcium peaks depends more strongly um, on activation or G. Uh, and so it has a more sensitive dynamic range. Uh, and a few future directions. Uh, one thing I didn't mention a second ago was with this order parameter, what we're actually noticing for the weak coupling is that synchronization appears to reach some sort of maximum for a middle value of G. And then when G increases further, the synchronization actually decreases. And I have some hunches about why this is, uh, but I'd like to probe that a bit further. 
Uh, we'd also like to demonstrate that these relationships between assortativity and activation or, or network uh, activation are not limited to sort of this bursting model only, could consider some other models, maybe Kuramoto model or uh, if it's Yunagumo, Heinmarsh Rose, something like that. And then ad additionally, uh, we kind of constrained our heterogeneity to, uh, to keep things as simple as we could, but I'd like to introduce additional heterogeneities into the excitability and the coupling uh, to see how these relationships will change. Okay, so thank you for that. Um, I appreciate your time. Brilliant, thank you very much, Danny. Um, we've got time for one quick question. Um, oh. Uh, Cindy, is that a question? Uh, it's the start of a question, or do you want to unmute? Danielle, can people unmute um, themselves? Yes, they can. You mean me? Yes, yes. Oh, yes. Um, you talked about the pancreas at the beginning, and I was wondering if you have uh, a connection between your assortativity mm -hmm. uh, definitions which are uh, very appealing and the function of the pancreas. Um, yes, yeah, so at the minute, no. Um, at the minute we're trying to stay relatively data ag agnostic and just kind of general, just generally look at this relationship of assortativity. What we do know is that in the pancreas there is this spatial non-uniformity. What we don't have a good way of doing yet is to identify uh, what that spatial non-uniformity actually looks like in, a, in, a, in, a, in the pancreas. And one of the kind of things that would be really interesting to do, and we have thought about ways that we might be able to do this, is to actually um, gather data to understand sort of, for example, using this assortativity measure to try to assign that to an actual uh, pancreatic islet, for example, and then try to map these results onto experimental finding, findings more closely. Um, but we haven't, we haven't quite found the way, but we do have the collaborators to do it. So it's, it's really interesting. And we hope that that's, that's, that's one way that we definitely want to go. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I think in the interest of time, we will move on uh, as it is the hour now. So uh, Michael, uh, Danny, do you want to stop sharing? And Michael, you can start. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. Great stuff. Uh, I'll just give you a minute to. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, so our next speaker is Michael Forrester from the University of Nottingham. Uh, he can probably tell us uh, the answer to Alan's question about what they call the Nottingham model in, in Nottingham. Uh, he's going to be talking to us about simulating functional connectivity and the next generation neural mass model of a human cortical network. Uh, Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kyle, and thanks very much for the invitation. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'll talk really, uh, I mean, this is really a story of, of two networks. So um, what I'm, I'm doing is considering um, the anatomical uh, structure of the brain um, and also the, uh, what we call a functional network. Um, so anatomical structure is, uh, I guess, kind of self-explanatory. Um, so uh, this network here is, um, derived from diffusion MRI imagery. Um, and that's where um, you look at the, uh, the diffusion of water in the brain to um, determine where uh, you find white matter traps. And um, each of these pixels uh, relates to the density of um, the white matter traps between two areas of the brain. Um, and then anal uh, analogous to that, we've got um, a functional matrix. And uh, this is derived here from uh, MEG data. So that's when um, you look at uh, two regions of the brain and uh, they'll generate some, um, some signal uh, based on the uh, on, on, on magnetic um, signals um, generated by uh, the electrical activity within the, within the cortex. Um, and again, you can, you can look at the connections, um, pair, pairwise connections uh, based on um, correlations between those, uh, those two time courses uh, for the magnetic signals arising from the brain. Um, so these are both the empirical, um, um, th these are empirical data sets. Um, but what we really want to do is to provide some kind of a mathematical computational foundation um, that allows us to, to input our structure into some kind of uh, so some mathematical model. 
and um, and allow us to to generate a, a functional network that uh, that resembles what we find in empirical data. Uh, and this kind of links back to to what uh, Alan was saying at the the end of his talk about um, what what the, what are the important uh, markers, kind of what what the what are the features that we can put into this model that uh, that are very important for generating uh, functional connectivity. Um, and that's that's kind of the the crux of what I, I'm interested in. Um, so so I'll briefly describe what, uh, the generic network model. So we've got our structure which we can. Um, uh, put into a matrix, uh, a weighted connectivity matrix, and this just defines the uh, the long range coupling in our model. Um, we use a mean field reduction, so rather than considering large populations of neurons, which is uh, kind of um, sort of inf not really feasible for for, for computing large uh, large networks, so we consider mean field reductions. So this is a uh, uh, we just track the um, the average population activity. Um, and we typically consider excitatory populations coupled to inhibitory populations uh, with some self-coupling. Um, and, and this could be described by, uh, for instance, Wilson Cowan or, or indeed uh, the Nottingham model, <laughs> as Alan uh, suggested earlier. Um, so how, how best to fit um, these models to functional connectivity? Well, we could consider her heterogeneity. Uh, and I've just highlighted two papers here where uh, they do just that. So um, in the top paper by uh, Deco and colleagues, um, they consider each of the, the nodes in this network to be um, to have different intrinsic frequencies. Uh, and in um, the bottom paper there by uh, Demirtas and colleagues, uh, they consider um, the the um, the intrinsic um, the the interpopulation coupling strengths to be different between each each node. Um, and this is important because you know we we know that different regions of the brain certainly operate differently. Um, but in our models, we prefer to uh, to use uh, homogeneous networks. Um, and the re reason for this is, firstly, we're mathematicians <laughs> and it's, it's much easier um, in terms of mathematical analysis when all of the nodes have the same um, intrinsic uh, model properties. Um, but also it allows us to kind of expose the the uh, the role of the the topology because we know if we if we decouple everything all of these nodes are going to operate in the exact same way so all of the sort of um, the differences between um the correlation uh, between the nodes comes directly from the the particular type of topology that we're putting into this model so it allows us to sort of explore a bit more um about the role of the the topology and how the intrinsic dynamics kind of can be used to explore how we can excite uh, different network states. Um, so we had a first look at uh, a, a, we we looked at this first in in this uh, in this paper uh, that came out last year, um, and the aim here was really just to to see how much of the um, the kind of structure function uh, relationship we could um, predict or sort of determine uh, by just analysing the the single node model so again it's a homogeneous um neural neural mass network um and what we found was that when we uh, when we just looked at these functions similarity so we, we computed the uh, the function by a pairwise correlation between uh, the nodes time series um and if we moved in parameter space um and we just chose two parameters a 2d parameter space where um a is the um amplitude of the um, excitatory uh, response to input and B is the uh, inhibitory response. Um, and this is the, the, the Janssen Ritt um, model, by the way. Um, and, uh, but, but really, I just wanted to illustrate that um, if, we, if we just have this homogeneous um, model and we, we move around in this parameter space, we can excite lots of different uh, networks which vary in similarity between the, the underlying structure. Um, and if we overlay the bifurcation diagram, so here just uh, in, in panel A, um, just overlay the bifurcation diagram where the solid white lines are the hot bifurcations, the dashed lines are saddle node, um, and in black are a particular kind of, um, not, not really bifurcation, they're actually called force bifurcations, but um, they, they really relate to when the, um, the, the waveform of the oscillations change their, their um, form from a double peaked wave 
uh, to a single peak wave. Um, and the the um, this black um, bifurcation set arises from a uh, inflection point within the wave as it as it moves between those two um, those two types. Uh, and we find out those particularly important because um, just around the sort of neighbourhood of that uh, false uh, bifurcation set, we see um, a very low um, structure function similarity. And then we can look at the um, we can relate this to the stability of synchrony in the network. So um, using a, a weakly coupled framework, we can derive the uh, fa uh, phase interaction function for the network. And uh, looking at the stability of synchrony um, in that network. And again, this is um, completely, this doesn't care about the topology. This is just in a, a globally coupled network. But nevertheless, we find that uh, stability of synchrony relates quite well to where we see um, a very low um, structure function similarity. So here, negative uh, negative parts of the, this parameter space are um, um, unstable synchrony and positive is stable synchrony. So when we have unstable synchrony, we see very low structure function similarity. But I've, I've really just included these results just to um, sort of illustrate the fact that you don't need a um, sort of complicated analysis of, the, of all the network interactions to, to understand the network um, emergent network response. Um, you can actually say quite a lot about the, the network dynamics just by studying the, um, the nodal dynamics. Um, but what would happen to this if we use a, an even more complicated model? So this is the answer, a phenomenological model. Um, we wanted to move on to more complex um, models such as the the uh, next generation neural mass model and that's what i'll um, describe briefly in the next part um so we start with the um the montbrio uh Pazzo and roxanne model um and this is where the sort of uh, the first kind of iteration of the not to be model i suppose uh, came from um so so this was um developed from a globally coupled network of quadratic integrating fire neurons uh, with pulsatile coupling uh, given by this function S of T. And uh, what the authors did was uh, they made uh, two assumptions to get the uh, to get a mean field reduction in closed form. Uh, the first was that they assumed that the, um, the states of the um, neurons in this um, population followed a Lorentzian distribution. And the second was that the drives to these neurons also follow the Lorentzian distribution. Um, and that allowed them to uh, solve the continuate, uh, continu continuity equation, which is there at the top of, um, of oscillators, um, by exploiting the pole structure of, of, of these Lorentzians. Um, and that allows you to reduce all of those uh, complicated dynamics, in infinite dimensional dynamics, into this very simple a uh, two-dimensional um, OD system where R is the firing rate and V is the, the, the average membrane potential. Um, so this is where the Nottingham part of the <laughs> Nottingham model comes in. So this, um, um, in, in 2019, Stephen Coombs and Anya Byrne released this uh, paper where they added um, synaptic dynamics uh, to the model. Um, so they included this uh, synaptic con uh, conductivity variable G um, which was uh, which is governed by this um, this uh, uh, differential uh, differential operator Q, um, and that relates the synaptic conductivity to the uh, to the firing rate of the of the population. And this has recently been uh, augmented uh, in a paper that's just come out this year, uh, where they've added uh, gap junctions. Um, the also added gap junctions to the model. Uh, so this is given by a simple ohmic law. Um, where we just consider a, uh, a gap junction coupling uh, kappa v um, and the uh, difference between the pre and post synaptic uh, potentials bj and vi. Um, and this allows us to um, get a, a sort of augmented version of the, of the Montbrio um, model uh, with these synaptic uh, conduct, um, reverse potentials and the um, gap junction coupling. Uh, for, for just a single population. So now we need to uh, expand this to the network. Um, so we consider um, some local uh, dynamics, sort of within node dynamics. Um, 
And we just have a, a differential equation as we had before. Where we have this differential operator Q um, and, and the um, and coupling uh, cap AB. Uh, and the ABs here are just um, subscripts describing whether we're talking about the excitatory or in inhibitory populations. Um, but then we also have to consider the, the non-local dynamics given by the, the long range connections. And here it's, uh, it's, it's simple just to um, consider additive coupling. So rather than giving every single connection its own um, synaptic conductivity variable, we just give each node kind of a conductivity variable describing um, this, the synaptic activity um, of all of the external um, incoming um, synaptic potentials. Um, so this finally, uh, oh, and also it's quite important to, to note that we only consider coupling between um, excitatory populations um, because generally in the brain, the, the long range uh, dendritic connections tend to uh, be excitatory and not inhi inhibitory. So, um, but it, it's just a way to, to simplify the model a bit while uh, respecting the biology. Um, so this uh, allows us to um, formulate the, the final version of the model, which um, seems a, a lot more messy than, than, than the initial version, but it's really, uh, it's got all the ingredients uh, that we've described. And uh, we just have these um, subscripts A, which describe the, uh, the population that um, we're looking at, and which is, um, receives input from these populations B. Um, and we also include timescales uh, tau A to, to, uh, to characterize the um, the, the, the timescales of, um, of activity. Um, so now we've got our nice uh, network model. Uh, we want to come up with some, some useful applications for it. Uh, and the first thing we thought to, to try was um, to see if we could understand anything, um, <laughs> understand what, how, um, how TMS might operate in the brain. Um, so when we first went to clinicians saying, well, we've got this, this network model, it's got all these biophysical properties. Uh, they were very interested in seeing if we could understand anything about uh, how TMS works. And TMS is transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, it's a non-invasive um, treatment for, for conditions such as depression. And it's essentially um, pulsatile um, pulses of, uh, of electromagnetic um, um, fields instant onto the scalp. Uh, but they find it, it, it's it's quite an uh, it has lots of efficacy in treating these these sorts of conditions. So they're very interested in what what sort of mechanisms might be um, might be behind its efficacy. Um, so we we um, started by just um, driving the the network model, um, and so we started with some kind of some initial conditions. We gave we gave the um, the model the structure, and it, it gave us some function. Which we derive from a pairwise correlation between time series, um, and then we um, we try to stimulate different nodes in the network to see what kind of uh, functional connectivity uh, changes we could see. Um, so when you talk to clinicians, that they're very interested in sort of TMS protocols, and they find that the the results they get in these uh, in empirical experiments is very sensitive to. Uh, what protocols uh, they use, such as the, the frequency of, of, of TMS pulses or uh, the target site. So we, we focused on, on changing the target site and we found that we could generate very different um, functional connectivities based on which target site we were, we were looking at. Um, so we thought, we, we decided to take a step back and see, well, we, we know we can generate all these states, but um, can we generate very biologically relevant states? Um, so we thought, okay, let's try to um, to simulate the, the most basic um, sort of baseline state of the brain, the, the resting state data. Um, so that's what I'll be talking about for the remainder of this talk. Um, so uh, we started by adding a bit more biology to the, to the model uh, by including delays. Um, so for these external connections, uh, we just considered a, a small delay on the uh, on the incoming um, firing firing rate, uh, which is given by this these tau ij um, parameters, and they're just the the path the the average path distance 
between uh, between nodes uh, divided by some universal uh, conductance velocity v. So what you can do with these uh, with these delays is you can actually excite um, oscillatory patterns. So if we start with some steady state, we can add delays, and this uh, changes the the stability of the system to generate delays and. We can play the same games as before and, and generate functional connectivity patterns um, using these delays. But then we really want to see, oh, well, if we if we can generate these patterns, can we um, sort of prime the model using some some analysis to to kind of predict what sort of patterns uh, we expect to uh, to emerge? Um, so we did some linear analysis um, and. Because of our assumptions of this network being homogeneous, uh, it allows us to reduce the problem quite a bit. Um, and when you uh, work out the Jacobian for the entire network, um, the the actual stability um, is given by this these, this block um, diagonal form, um, and each block is parameterized entirely by um, by the eigenvector structure. Of the uh, connectivity matrix, so expect the, these um, these eigenvectors or, or eigen modes um, to be intrinsic in the in the patterns that we excite in the system. Um, so by by solving this Jacobian, you can see these um, eigen modes initially are, are very close together, um, and the the first eigen mode sits just behind the seventh, so I've just picked. Two eigen modes, just as an example, um, and then after we add delays um, on the on, on in the panel uh, on the right, you can see that the, there's many more um, eigenvalues that appear, but uh, importantly, we've shifted the order of these eigen modes. So now um, eigen mode seven um, is in front and falls just beyond the um, the, the imaginary axis. Um, so we refer, refer to this as, as exciting an eigen mode. Um, but now we need to sort of test whether, whether this is uh, predictive at all of, of what we see in simulations. Um, so if we prime the model if, at a point where we excite just a single eigen mode, we can do this uh, cosine similarity on the eigenvector to, to generate a pattern um, that we hope will be, uh, be similar to the, the functional connectivity pattern um, that we see in simulations. Um, and indeed, we we get a very similar pattern. So just just by eyeballing these these two um, these two uh, matrix outputs, you can see that the eigen mode um, is does resemble um, quite closely uh, the result of the the simulation. So this is good because this means that our um, our linear analysis is predictive of the um, of the the functional connectivity we see in simulations. Um, but now we've got the challenge of actually trying to um, to find eigen modes that resemble the empirical functional connectivity, um, and then being able to excite them in the model. Uh, and this is <laughs> this is really the the, uh, the challenge that that we have at the moment. So so if we look at the uh, the eigen modes, uh, we find that uh, quite very few of them actually seem to contribute to the um, to the FC. So if we if we just take an eigen mode and see the error between the um, empirical functional activity and the eigen mode and take the mean squared error um, and we compute this um, measure called the r2 norm and that just tells us um, how, how good that eigen mode is at explaining the variance in, in functional connectivity um, and the, the the values aren't strong but importantly we only really see um, relatively few uh, eigen modes, only three here that that contributes um, to any sort of degree the the, uh, the functional connectivity. Um, so so we can pick out one, and even even though the the, the fit isn't great, we can clearly see um, quite a lot of similarity um, in the in the pattern that uh, in the eigen modes, which is the top panel, and the empirical functional connectivity, which is the bottom panel. Um, so even even though it doesn't fit quite well, there's still um, there's still a lot of structure there that's clearly inherited from the the eigen mode. Uh, and then we can put this into a simulation. Um, so, compute the um, 
the linear uh, analysis allows us to define these uh, these borders of stability in, in certain parameter spaces. Um, and this allows us to, to pick out where we expect to excite these modes of interest. So for instance, we, we can look at the, this very narrow um, region here between borders um, it's the functional connectivity um, and compute the, the R2 norm as with as with the eigenmodes. Um, and at the moment, we're not getting <laughs> getting things that are, that are incredibly strong, but um, they're, they're commensurate with um, with what we were seeing um, with the with just the, the sort of raw eigenmodes, um, the kind of fits that we were getting there. Um, but the, yeah, but there are certainly challenges in the, in the future to try and to, to try and make this model better. Um, so the, the, I think the one of the most interesting ones is to see. I mean, we've got this uh, this model with lots of uh, biophysical parameters in it, uh, but which is the best as a sort of exploratory parameter to excite lots of different modes? Um, and can that tell us a bit about uh, the sort of mechanism um, behind functional connectivity? Um, also, there's the actual uh, structural connectivity that we have is, uh, is generated from, um, from, quite, uh, from this diffusion MRI data. But there's quite a lot of, um, of steps to process that before it gets into the matrix that we, um, we put into the model. So um, what we're studying now is what's the best way to process uh, that structural data, the raw diffusion MRI, MRI data, to get a matrix that uh, best um, allows us to simulate uh, functional connectivity. Um, and also, if we have resting state data, um, we're, we're obviously looking at the static data here, but um, in, in real um, empirical data, there's lots of um, non-stationary features. So um, if you look at very short epochs of time, you'll see a very different functional connectivity to, to another epoch. So it'd be interesting to see if we can possibly um, see some of those non-stationary features um, if we if we do sort of narrower time windows in our um, in our simulations. Um, and then of course we want to put this all all back into the TMS question again and see well if we if we can prime if we can trust the uh, the model to generate resting state data um, can we can we see now what happens when we when we simulate it with stimulate it with these uh, TMS protocols. And, and perhaps gain a bit more of a, an insight into into the um, mechanisms behind TMS. Um, so, what, what one last thing that we're thinking of doing, which I'll just explain very quickly, is um, so the, the one of the first uses of the of the, of the Nottingham model was to um, to generate uh, the beta rebound effect, where um, during movement you see this uh, strong decrease in beta band power, and then um, after movement the, the uh, the power rebound, so you see a, a strong increase just after movement in, in the beta bound power. Um, and the brain, um, over over a long period of time, you, you tend to see these uh, these bursts. So rather than seeing this rebound effect, you just see these kind of uh, transient, very transient increases in beta power, uh, which are known as beta bursts. And um, these have uh, been proven to well have been shown to be a, a biomarker uh, for functional connectivity. Um, by looking at the, the correlation of bursts uh, in different regions of the brain. So we're also looking at this as kind of a, another avenue to try and uh, to try and fit the model to, to functional connectivity data. But, uh, but that's something for the future, I think. Uh, so finally, I'd just like to say thank you for everyone for listening. And uh, I'd like to thank my supervisors, uh, Stephen Coombs and Ruben O'Day, uh, to Stan Sotteropoulos, who processed all the structural connectivity data and uh, Sammy Petros, who's uh, written all the nice codes to to do all the of the uh, delay uh, system computations. So uh, yes, yeah, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, I'll answer any questions. Great, thanks very much, Michael. Uh, are there any questions from the floor? In which case, I'll I'll lead us off. Um, so, in thinking about these sort of large scale extractions of functional connectivity from these kinds of data. They're obviously quite sensitive to the approach that you use and, and most of these approaches have some sort of threshold. So A, are your results dependent on how you do that? And B, sort of in the back of my mind, I wonder, I worry, well, wonder if you're asking the model to do, mu to, to, do too much to predict 
the eigenmode that you excite across the entire parcellation of the brain. Do you have any comments on that? Um, yes. So um, I think it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it is perhaps quite ambitious to try and say, well, I mean, the brain's obviously going to be doing things that are a lot more complex. And this is where these uh, more heterogeneous models come into play because, you know, we're, we're assuming that these, uh, this topology is, is basically the, the only thing that, um, that is generating the functional connectivity, which is, you know, it's not, um, that's certainly not the case. But I think what we're just trying to do is to, um, to simplify the model as much as we can so we can get some analytical tractability just to say, okay, we, we can prime the model to excite this eigenmode, which we know is um, pretty important um, in terms of generating, in, in terms of the, the overlap with the functional connectivity. Um, but then once we have that, we can sort of start thinking about adding more ingredients and saying, well, we can we can add things like, um, you know, th thalamocortical loops, for instance, that, that are a lot more important in generating rhythms in the brain. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we, we definitely know it's not the full story. It's just uh, a sort of step into trying to uh, to to um, simulate realistic functional connectivity. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jen, do you have a quick question? Hi, yes, thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can compute functional connectivity from neurological data. So how robust are your methods to some of those different approaches? Yeah, so um, that's a very good question. Yeah, so there's, um, there is lots of different sort of correlations that you can use. Um, and we've uh, we've tested a couple, so so we've we, we've used Pearson correlation just on the time series, um, but often we find that um, that sort of washes out a lot of the um, interesting um, correlations you find um, because th there's some more interesting correlations perhaps in different frequency bands. So what we've been trying to do lately is to use uh, amplitude envelope correlation um, within different frequency bands. To um, to see how how those might correlate better in terms of the the um, the eigenmodes we're trying to excite in terms of the the similarities to uh, functional connectivity. Um, so so yeah, there's there's lots of different avenues for for explanation for for yeah for, for looking at these things. Um, and yeah, I think there's a, <laughs> there's definitely a lot more we could do to, further down the line to to um, to, to to test that. Great, thank you. Interesting. No problem. Okay, great. Thanks again, Michael. Uh, and I think it is time to move on. So thank if you want to stop sharing the screen, and I'd like to invite our final speaker, uh, Itama, if you want to share your screen now. Great. So uh, our last but by no means least uh, speaker in this mini is Itama Landau, who I've woken up early uh, from uh, in California. Uh, so I saw him drinking his coffee there. So I'd be primed and ready to go. Uh, so Itama will be talking to us about macroscopic fluctuations emerging in balanced networks with incomplete recurrent alignment. Uh, so please take it away. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invite. And yeah, I'm deep into my second cup of coffee over here. I told Kyle, I hope the early morning hour will also uh, slow down the pace a little bit. So um, yeah, I'll be talking to you all about um, work for my PhD, the last uh, project from, from my PhD with Chaim Sompolinsky at the Hebrew University. Um, it touches on a couple of previous works that I, that I may get to mention. And so the outline, I'll tell you about the broad aim, the broadest strokes and the theoretical modeling framework that we pursue, um, which is the dynamic balance of excitation and inhibition. And then the main focus is this model that, that we study, which is a generalization of dynamic EI balance. Um, and we'll study that model throughout the rest of the talk, first beginning with a concept we call aligned con connectivity um, and the dynamics that emerge there. Um, and then what happens when that connectivity is, is misaligned. So in the broadest strokes, what my PhD was, was all about was thinking about the relationship between structure and dynamics. As we all know, um, we're in really the era of large scale experimental neuroscience. Now this last decade has really moved us forward, both in terms of the structure, in a sense of, for example, uh, advances in dense connectomics using electron microscopy, 
Um, and here, my focus is really local cortical circuits, although you know, once you're modeling, models, models can have implications in all kinds of places. Um, and certainly, we've seen advances in, in, this, in, a, in terms of the dynamics, in terms of large-scale recordings of neuron activity simultaneously. And at the broadest strokes, my, my focus throughout my PhD was to try to understand what can theory tell us about the relationship between structure and dynamics, um, and that you really need to have a strong theoretical framework, in, in particular with regards to the dynamical state that you assume the network to be in, in order to really approach that question and make sense of also eventually experimental data um, re regarding both structure and dynamics. So the theoretical framework here is the excitation and inhibition balance. And so very briefly, um, I hope some of you have some familiarity, but very briefly, the idea in this modeling approach, which has become canonical to describe the neural activity in local uh, cortical circuits, is that each neuron in a local cortical circuit receives a large number of incoming synapses, the number n is the representing the total number of neurons in the network. So a neuron would get order of magnitude n incoming synapses. Um, and each of those synapses in this framework is strong. So strong is, is modeled in the sense that it's one over square root of n scaling of a single synapse relative to the threshold. So that the net input current, um, let me just check that you guys can see my mouse. I can't even see my mouse right now. So. Uh, I'm not sure I can see your mouse. <laughs> yeah, let me see here. I'm sorry about that. Uh, where's the zoom function here? I tried it out yesterday. Sorry about that. I don't have it. Um, but there might there might be a setting you need to activate in the the actual the software that you're using to present. I mean, not, yeah, not the, I went. I did it yesterday with the. Okay, well, I'll try it without. All right, so you see, so we have the single synapses that are scaled as one over square root of n. The result of that is that the net currents are going to be large. So in the, the top lines there, you see that the schematic representing the total excitatory input into a network would be large relative to threshold with a scaling of order square root of n. Um, and similarly, the potential inhibitory current would be very large relative to the threshold. The main insight of the EI balance framework is that as long as the inhibitory synapses are sufficiently strong to stabilize network activity, then these networks will reach a dynamic balance in which the excitatory and inhibitory firing rates, RE and RI, will dynamically balance in order to cancel the potentially large current. And, and so that, that term in, in the, inside the parentheses will effectively be zero in the theoretical framework in the large n limit. Um, and that allows uh, fluctuations to dominate the actual firing um, as, the, as the mean large currents are canceled. Um, and that yields two linear equations, right? right? Setting those parentheses with the term inside the parentheses to zero will yield two linear equations for the two population firing rates. And those are independent of the single neuron nonlinearity. So that's an emergent feature um, of, of this network model. And the, this framework has been found to be able to account for a number of different observations of cortical activity, the regular firing of individual neurons, asynchronous population activity with low pairwise correlations, and log normal uh, rate distributions, among many others. So this is the framework that, that we're going to jump into, um, but now generalizing it beyond the particulars of EI, of excitation emission uh, structure. So this is the model, and this is the model I'm going to talk about throughout the whole, the whole, the whole rest of this talk. Um, it's a rate neuron model where we're modeling the dynamics of the membrane potential, if you if you wish, H. So we have a column vector of n neurons with their membrane potential HI, and those those are the dynamic variables. And then going from left to right, those are driven by current random connectivity J, which we just take to be to be Gaussian. And then here's the key part, a rank D, low, low rank, strong structured connectivity component. So it's low rank. We have these uh, in singular, in reduced SVD configuration. So the, the matrix U the, is the, the left singular vectors, the matrix V are the right singular vectors. 
and sigma is the diagonal is a diagonal matrix with the singular values of the low rank component uh, of this connectivity. And in particular, it has a strong scaling. So each element has, a, has that strength one over square root of n that I mentioned before um, coming from the EI balance framework. And then we have a, an instantaneous firing rate function. Um, so R is the firing rate of the neurons. And finally, we have a, an external drive, which we also assume to be strong at the level of single synapses so that the net input that neurons receive is also has that square root of n scaling. And now we can schematize this model and think about the that we have the random connectivity j, um, which tends to we we'll gives us high something high dimensional and what we call microscopic, and then the the low rank structure we can think about as as um, doing a readout and feedback. Each mode from that S, SVD configuration has the a vector a vector v. Sorry about that. A vector v performing a readout from network activity and an associated vector u sending feedback into the network activity. OK, and now some examples that we're going to see that are both kind of inspiration and also we're going to see throughout, throughout this talk, um, basic examples. So if we just think about a two population excitation ambition model, so the connectivity structure there has a block, a block structure, one block for each population, right? So it's a rank two. That's essentially the structured part of that connectivity is a rank two regardless of the size of the complete of the whole network. And we can we can put that in the SVD form. It will have the column space, the matrix U will have two vectors, one essentially some, some mode with two positive blocks. And the other one will have a difference mode, a positive block and a negative block. And similarly too, for the row space or the, or the right singular vectors, they'll also have a difference mode and a sum mode. And typically the external drive vector also would have that same population structure. Um, so it would also fall in the span of the sum mode and the difference mode. And we'll come back to that, to that later. And then also we can study uh, models, for example, with heterogeneous degrees. Um, so to simplify here, what I'm thinking about is a single population, a single inhibitory population, if you want, with, with uh, heterogeneous in degrees and out degrees. And in that case, the expectation of a single synapse Right, the deterministic part we can would would be proportional to the product of in degree and out degree of the two neurons interacting, and therefore that deterministic component can be written as a, a rank one matrix where the left singular vectors are proportional u the u the u vector is proportional to the in degree and the v vector the right singular vectors are proportional to the out degree, and then we might have an external uh, in degree an external in degree from the external population. And we'll come back to that as well, okay? Um, and throughout, I'm gonna to try to keep uh, the equations that we're talking about kind of there in the, in the bottom, where, bottom where relevant. Um, okay, so the main, the first uh, theoretical, the first uh, mathematical step we'll take in order to analyze the dynamics of these models is what we call the balanced subspace decomposition and just project everything onto the um, left singular vectors onto that matrix U. So we take the activity vector R in a population space, for example, and project it down. It has a component parallel or within the, the, the span of U in the left singular vectors of the, of the low rank connectivity. And we call that subspace the balanced subspace. And we're going to represent that relative with its components relative, relative to those vectors U. So we have R hat zero, R hat one is going to be our balanced subspace activity. And those are going to give us the, the macroscopic order parameters for if we have rank D matrix, so they have D order parameters for the activity, for the dynamics there. And then we have an orthogonal component of the activity, orthogonal to the columns of U. And for example, in the two examples we're, we're focusing on in the just standard EI, EI network model, R hat zero would be some kind of a sum mode with maybe a, a weighted sum generally of both excit the excitatory population and the inhibitory population activity. And the second, sorry about that, the second mode would be some kind of difference mode, again, um, with some weighted difference mode between the two populations. Um, and in our second example, with heterogeneous degrees, so R hat will be a weighted sum of the activity of all the neurons, and it'll be weighted according to, in proportional to the, the in degrees of, of each neuron, right? So that's, that's our decomposition. And we can do that to decompose the dynamics as well. 
right? So we write the, the dynamical variables, project that also into the, the, onto the columns of U, the left singular vectors of our dynamics to give us a D-dimensional dynamics on the left side in the balance, what we call the balance subspace and n-dimensional dynamics in the orthogonal subspace. Okay, so we'll focus first on the dynamics in the balance subspace, the d-dimensional dynamics, right, in, this, in, the, in the subspace defined by the matrix U, by the column vectors. And what we present, uh, introduce here is a, a concept called alignment. So that when we say a low rank connectivity is aligned if the span of its left singular vectors is equal to the span of its right singular vectors, span U equals span V, we call that full recurrent alignment. For example, in our EI case, that's exactly what we have. The U and, and V vectors have the exact same span. They're both either a sum mode or a difference mode. And then we define the alignment matrix called V hat. And it's basically the overlaps between each left singular vector and right singular vector. And what we observe is a fairly straightforward observation is our definition of full alignment is entirely equivalent to the requirement that V hat, the alignment matrix, be orthonormal. So the V transpose V is equal to the identity. And it's also equivalent to the requirement that you can write V, the right singular vectors of the low rank component of connectivity. You can write it simply as some kind of a ro rotation of U including potential flips, right? So V equals U times V hat. Okay, so we use that assumption for now of aligned connectivity, aligned recurrent connectivity. Um, sorry about the misaligned uh, figure here. And um, so we to use that full alignment criterion to go back to our dynamics in the balance subspace. And we see what happens. We plug in that um, expression for V um, and we can we see here that when we when we plug that expression in for v, we wind up with a, a dynamics where v hat the alignment matrix is essentially playing a role of a recurrent connectivity matrix within that balanced subspace, and we have this nice form where we have the d-dimensional dynamics at least have the form of kind of looking entirely self-contained, right? The d the d-dimensional dynamic variables h hat have a dynamics that depend on r hat. Um, I should, of course, I've mentioned that R hat has a nonlinearity in there, so that includes also a contribution from the entire n-dimensional dimensional system. And I'll also mention that I've ignored here a small order one over square root of n contribution, which would come from the random components of connectivity. But so this is the description of the of the dynamics in the balanced subspace. And importantly, right, we have the square root of n term because by construction we put in strong synapses in the low rank structure, we have square root of n term leading so that these, the balanced subspace, the d-dimensional balanced subspace has potentially very large input, just as, as we saw in the EI, classic EI uh, framework. And that leads to a balance requirement. In order for the balanced subspace to avoid saturation by that strong, kind of, by that strong current, so the balanced subspace firing rates, R hat, will have to dynamically reach the fixed point that will satisfy this linear equation, right? And with this framework, and in the case of what we're of full alignment here, where v hat, the v hat matrix, the alignment matrix, in this case, as as we said, is orthonormal. We can also we can also in a nice in a nice form, a nice it's got a nice aesthetic flavor at least. Write down write down the solution to that balance equation in d dimensions, right? And so this balance. Um, requirement and the, the balance equation, this is a direct generalization of the EI balance equations um, with the same properties where the, the activity in this balance subspace is linear with respect to external drive. Um, and it, the equations, the balance equation itself, they're independent of the, in the single neuron nonlinearity, as well as whatever's going on in the orthogonal subspace dynamics. Now, whether that balance solution is actually obtained, that's definitely dependent on the nonlinearity um, as well as the dynamics in the orthogonal subspace. But the balance equation um, is, in, is, is independent of, of those. Okay, now staying within the balance subspace, we've reached that fixed point in order to avoid saturation. Now we can study the fluctuations within that, that, that balance subspace, the macroscopic uh, fluctuations. 
in the d-dimensional balance subspace. And writing down the equations for those fluctuations relative to the time average, we see that very small fluctuations in activities in R hat will lead to large or order one uh, fluctuations in the dynamical variable H hat. And th those we would, we argue, will cause violation can will cause violations of the balance equation. So therefore the balance solution requires that we have small fluctuations in the dynamical variable in the membrane potential delta H hat. And that in turn will require that the fluctuations in the activity in the balance subspace are even much smaller than one over square root of n. And indeed that's what we find numerically and I'll come back to that is that the variance of the activity um, in these in these networks of, of in the balanced subspace scales as one over n squared, so that the fluctuation, macroscopic fluctuations in the balanced subspace are suppressed. Um, and this, just to, to point out, I'm assuming here that the external drive is totally constant. Is totally constant. Um, and this is also mentioned in a recent paper by John, by uh, Jonathan Katmon. And so that's the the picture in the balanced subspace is one that generalizes EI balance. We have a linear balance equation and we have a suppression of fluctuations. And now moving over to the orthogonal subspace. So now we do the projection into the subspace orthogonal to the columns of, of the matrix U and study the dynamics there. And we introduce another concept of alignment and here it's external alignment. We say the external, uh, the external input is aligned if the vector along which the external input enters the network is, is in the span, um, that's to say the span of U, sorry for the typo. So if F is in the span of U, we call that external alignment. And if that's the case, then the F vector, the external input has no um, strong projection onto the orthogonal subspace. And in that case, the dynamics in, are entirely driven by the random component of connectivity, J. And these, uh, these dynamics are, are essentially identical to this classic work from Zempolinsky, Chrysanti, Summers in 1988, where due to the random connectivity, the net input into, in this case, into the orthogonal subspace, but the, the net input is approximated um, by independent Gaussian processes. So A to I there summing over all the random, the random connectivity is approximately Gaussian and independent. And this can be solved by a dynamic mean field theory, and these networks are well known to, to generate chaos. So the picture is that now in the, in the orthogonal complement, the dynamics are driven by random connectivity that yield high dimensional um, and microscopic chaos. And so the interim summary is that generalized these networks with strong low rank connectivity plus a random component of connectivity generalize EI dynamic balance. Um, as I've, as I've already discussed, and I'll just jump to the bottom line of that conclusion, is so any macroscopic readout, whether it's from the balanced subspace where fluctuations are suppressed or from the orthogonal subspace where there's high dimensional chaos, any large macroscopic readout will have very, very small fluctuations, right? So there are no macroscopic fluctuations in generally in, in balanced networks and specifically in this in case of aligned connectivity. So I now we're going to look. I just want to give you a quick heads up. You have about five minutes left. Yeah, I just looked at my watch too. So I'm running a little bit slow. Sorry about that. Um, so we'll jump to the misaligned connectivity. Um, so we had two forms of, of alignment. First, external misalignment. So if the external vector is not following the span of the left singular vectors U, then we have strong drive into the orthogonal sus subspace. Essentially, that drive cannot be balanced because there is no structured connectivity to do that. And that will lead directly to saturation, even with the very small um, projections for the, of the external drive into that subspace. And that's indeed what we see um, in simulations. Um, and in fact, if we look at our example that we discussed previously of heterogeneous in degrees, if the external input has heterogeneous in degrees that are not almost fully correlated with recurrent in degrees, um, then we will see this suppression of fluctuations due to strong input into the orthogonal subspace. Um, and essentially this is what we observed in um, a previous paper in studying spiking networks um, with anatomically realistic heterogeneity of in degrees as we saw regular firing, essentially a suppression of fluctuations there. Okay, so that's the, what happens with misalignment in the orthogonal subspace or 
misalignment of the external drive. Now we turn to misalignment of the recurrent connectivity. So if, if the recurrent connectivity, the low rank structure is misaligned, it means that V hat, the alignment matrix is not orthonormal. And that means that the V, the right singular vectors have a component that is or that itself is orthogonal to the left singular vectors U. And now we go back to the dynamics, the D-dimensional dynamics in the balanced subspace and decompose those again. But now we have an added term due to the, the orthogonal component. So essentially the readout vectors, V, the right singular vectors are now reading out activity from the subspace orthogonal to the balanced subspace and projecting it into the balanced subspace. So the schematic now looks like this. We have a subspace recurrent connectivity um, defined through V hat and an effective feed forward connectivity through the perpendicular, which is reading out from that orthogonal subspace where microscopic chaos can fluctuate and projecting that forward into the balance subspace. Returning to the balance equations, just very briefly, in fact, to leading order, the balance equations themselves um, don't have a direct impact from that feed forward component because the feed forward component gives just order one uh, input. Um, but there, and so the balance equations um, are, not, are not directly impacted by that. But we find that the fluctuation balance equations are, are impacted by that. So if we go back to the fluctuation dynamics relative to a time average, we now have this eta hat term, which is carrying fluctuations that are driven from the orthogonal chaotic subspace into the balance subspace. Um, and again, by an argument that's similar to what I argued before, the, these fluctuations need to be canceled in order to preserve balance. And so what winds up happening is that the, the net presynaptic currents from each of the balance subspace modes are gonna be order one and in exactly in such a way that they cancel the order one fluctuations that are coming in from the orthogonal, from the orthogonal uh, subspace. And that's exactly what we, what we see here. We have a, a, a fluctuation balance equation and the fluctuating input eta hat is order one in red and it's being canceled dynamically by recurrent fluctuations within the balance subspace um, through delta r hat through the individual components of that. And in this framework, due to that this fluctuation balance, we can write a closed form solution for the covariance function C hat um, of each of the subspace modes, each of the balanced subspace modes, um, the, their cross uh, covariance functions. And the main form of that is dominated by, is defined through the SVD now of the alignment matrix. So for fans of the SVD, we did an SV, we have an SVD of the low rank structure um, and then took the overlap of, of left and right to give us a V hat. And now we take the SVD of that and using that we have a direct solution for um, the covariance structure in the balanced subspace. And the structurally it's defined, the principal components of that are, the, are exactly the left singular vectors of the alignment matrix. Now the time course of the fluctuations, these are macroscopic D-dimensional fluctuations, but the time course is defined directly from the uh, single neuron time course in the orthogonal, chaotic uh, orthogonal subspace. And the amplitude is determined by the singular values of the alignment matrix. So as we reduce the determinant of V hat or sing individual uh, singular values, the uh, amplitude of fluctuations greatly increases. So when we increase misalignment, we increase the amplitude of fluctuations in the balanced subspace. Um, and when compared to fully aligned connectivity, we have an increase of the amplitude of fluctuations by a factor of square root of n. Um, returning to our examples, and then I'll close. So in our example of heterogeneous, uh, in a heterogene, heterogeneous degrees, if we have heterogeneous out degrees, then the overlap between, say, for example, a uniform um, in degree and heterogeneous out degrees, that overlap decreases with the breadth of the out degree. And so too, as we find um, together with that, we have an increase in the macroscopic fluctuations. And finally, returning to EI structure, we said, I said at the beginning that EI structure tends to be fully aligned, but there's a particular case of EI structure that's commonly uh, studied in the field, which is this degenerate block matrix um, that's where the connectivity strengths are independent of postsynaptic 
population. And in that case, we have a rank one structure that um, where u and v, their overlap is not is not one, but smaller than one. As and we and as we decrease the the i to e ratio and come closer to instability, what we have actually is that the that decrease of alignment leads to a converging a, a divergent uh, prediction from our theory. And as the variance um, and we see the variance there indeed increases. And in the limit where those two vectors totally overlap, for example, when the i to E ratio is exactly one, there's a zero alignment. And that's actually uh, the case that we studied previously. And in that case, we have order one macroscopic fluctuations um, in the balanced subspace. So I'll close with that. I'll just briefly throw this at your, at your eyes, but won't get to talk about that. The, the generalized framework that we've, that we've introduced here encapsulates a large number of previous works that have studied balanced dynamics in particular structure, whether spatial structure, um, or um, group structure, block structure, and so on. Um, so that's that's it. We generalized the dynamic dynamic balance to arbitrary networks with arbitrary low rank structure, um, and seen how macroscopic fluctuations, which are typically suppressed uh, in balanced networks with what we call the line connectivity, macroscopic fluctuations emerge through uh, through misalignment. And with that, I'll just leave the questions up there and say thank you very much to Kyle for the invitation. Thank you all very much for listening. Thank you very much, Ismail. That was a fascinating talk. Um, I guess we have time for one very quick question. Uh, James has put a question in the chat. James, do you want to unmute yourself and ask it, or do you want me to read it out? Sure, I'm happy to. So I, I was just noting in spin glass systems, which um, I think Sonkolinsky's modeling is deriving from originally, so you have these disordered balanced networks the system tends to have different dynamics over very long periods of time, so it gets trapped in low energy configurations. So do you think that would happen in this system as well? So the dynamics would start to look different over very long periods of time, different from what you're looking at now? So there's a few differences um, between those kinds of models. And for one thing, I think the, the main difference there is those spin glass models, they have a disorder, um, which, is, which is symmetric. Um, so the JIJs are symmetric, uh, the random component is symmetric. Um, here we have JIJ where each of them are, are independent. So that leads to chaos that there is on a single, basically on a single time scale. Um, but if you introduced, for example, into the orthogonal com uh, component here, essentially into the random component, if you introduce elements of symmetry, then you would see um, some of those slow time scales. Um, and there is recent work from Serge and Ostrich and I think with Nicolas Brunel, uh, studying random networks with some extent of symmetry and showing that, that kind of slowing down and dynamical slowing. Mm -hmm. okay, thanks a lot. Very, it was a great talk. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so I think I have to yield this room now so that we can have the plenary, but I'd just like to end by thanking all of the mini symposium speakers for, some, for a fascinating set of talks uh, and to thank everyone uh, in the room for coming to the mini symposium. Um, I'm going to hand back now to, I guess, Daniele. Uh, oh, to me? Uh, no, okay. I, I don't know who said that. <laughs> me, Evelyn. Ah, sorry, Evelyn. So I can see you now. Okay, brilliant. I will. I will yeah. hand over the floor to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so welcome now to the um, in theory final talk and the third plenary of our meeting. And I'm uh, very happy to uh, to uh, welcome Katrin Ola here, um, who I hope is there and could start putting up her slide. I am. Um, yes, yeah, wonderful. Um, her background is in, in psychology and in her uh, research, she aims to, uh, to understand how uh, the human mind senses, experiences and processes taste. And in particular, how this processing connects to behavior. Um, in terms of her career, she has held various uh, positions as researcher and uh, professor and research group leader in research centers in academia and also in, uh, in industry and, um, and as well as in universities. And that was in Germany, in Switzerland, in, in Philadelphia. So she has, uh, uh, has been kind of around the globe in a, in a sense. 
and um, she has received a number of uh, uh, awards, and in particular, just this year, the so-called IFF reward for research in the psychophysics of uh, human taste and smell. And in the last year and a half, I guess, uh, she was very busy also um, organizing um, research and uh, yeah, into and about COVID-19 and the loss of smell and taste uh, that it induces. However, this is not what she's going to talk about today. She's talking about taste. Um, I don't know the actual uh, title, which is very embarrassing. Sorry about that. And before you begin, just uh, one note. In one of the previous channels, there was uh, a problem with a microphone. So after um, this last plenary talk, we will open channel two again for um, for the talk by Nadia Balnabruk, which did not pay, take place in the previous channel. channel. So don't go away after um, um, Katrin sp speaks and we have also done our closing remarks. Um, there will be another talk in this session, well, in the other session actually. So please, um, I give you the opportunity to talk, please. So thank you, Evelyn, for this uh, very nice introduction and for preparing everybody for this uh, shift of gear uh, topic-wise that is uh, supposed to come. So let me try share my screen, which should work now. Can you see my slides or my presenter view? Um. Uh, I see two small, small kind of blocks. Okay, let me try again. That is not supposed to be the one. So you should see only one. <clears throat> so let me try this. So now you should see only one slide. Wonderful. Um, so the title of my talk is a matter of taste, uh, large scale gustatory response patterns and how they predict taste related behavior. Um, and this is all in human uh, participants. And I will also take the liberty to ignore the animal literature, which uh, stems mostly from rodents, but which is beautifully aligned with uh, our data. So when we talk about taste, uh, normally we actually confuse taste and smell during the eating experience. But when I talk about taste, what I actually mean is really the basic taste qualities uh, such as salty, bitter, sweet, sour, umami, which is a yummy protein taste. Um, maybe also fat and others. So there are only very few categories. Uh, most of these categories, people still uh, discuss uh, whether they're really true taste qualities or not, um, but salty, bitter, sweet, and sour are those um, that are most established and everybody agrees on, and those will be in the focus of my talk. So most of these um, taste qualities can be put in relation with also a physiological um, function. For example, think of salty, um, which uh, helps us actually maintain our electrolyte balance. Uh, just think of a hot summer day, you maybe even exercise, you've been sweating, you lost a lot of salts. So then very often you experience some kind of craving for salty food. And this is your body telling you to fill up the electrolyte uh, stores. So, and similarly, we may crave something sweet, which is just our body telling us us, we need quick energy, and that typically comes from carbohydrates such as sugars. Uh, sour and bitter, on the other hand, have a little bit of different functions. So they do also have a warning function because sour lets us sense acids in our food and at high concentrations, acids can be harmful to our tissue, to our health. They can literally burn our uh, skin and um, damage our teeth and also indicate maybe spoiled foods like milk is not supposed to taste sour, for example. 
And bitter is also an interesting uh, quality in a, in, a, in a way that most bitter substances are actually toxic, at least at high concentration. So we don't like them inherently. So, but we can learn to appreciate them. And I put here some food examples, which taste bitter, like asparagus, and also beer and coffee. I mean, we learn to appreciate that simply because it has uh, nice pharmacological side effects. Um, and um, the fact that that um, that probably also I'm speaking here uh, today is that we know almost nothing about how the sense of taste works. And um, I was fascinated by that as a PhD student um, uh, when uh, after my PhD, I started uh, this research into taste. And still in this recent edition of this textbook uh, shown here to the left, uh, which is really used to educate uh, the our next generation of psychologists, you see the desk discrepancy of the amount of pages allocated to each sensory system, like while we have 142 pages dedicated to the visual system, we have five pages dedicated to page uh, to taste. And frankly, not everything is like really up to date on those five pages. So there's a tremendous need for research. And I have spent the past years to shed some light on urgent questions uh, on that matter. But that is not my work. So in the 70, late 70s already, people have shown actually um, that we have inherent preferences or aversions to those different tastes. Um, for example, here you see snapshots from video recordings, recordings taken uh, from newborns who were given different taste solutions. So on the upper left, you see a baby who got a sweet and obviously in a mommy a solution yields the same effect. So it got some sucrose on his lips and it's making a happy suckling face it's like smacking its lips. And um, on the um, upper right, you see the typical lemon face uh, once the baby is given uh, uh, a sour taste solution based on citric acid. It's very unhappy. Um, and uh, when it receives the salty taste shown in the lower right, it shows not much of a response. It's just like water. And on the... Um, on the lower uh, left, you see the bitter response. And if you were to look at the video, you would see that the baby is crying and gaping and trying to get rid of this horrible taste. So uh, those studies have been replicated in, in many species and also in humans again and again. So we can surely say that we have inherent uh, preference for sweet and umami an indifference to salty taste and an aversion uh, as we are born to sour and bitter taste as those may be harmful substances. And when we look actually in uh, what, um, what breast milk is actually constituted of, we will find a high uh, amount of sugar and also a high amount of protein uh, which would result in, in sweet and umami taste. And any newborn that wants to thrive and live uh, does very good in appreciating uh, those tastes. So there seems to be a very, um, very natural uh, idea behind this here. So as we grow up, the preference for sweet uh, remains, um, unfortunately for some of us, because it's very hard to resist all these delicacies uh, that we are offered. Uh, the sour taste aversion, particularly for high concentration remains. And salty taste is very prone uh, to nutrition and dietary factors. So it's really a spiral. The more salt we eat, the more salt we like, the more salt we eat. And you see the pattern. However, it can be reset. It's not an um, endless spiral. So if you uh, do a low sodium diet, you can reset your uh, salty preference and start over again.
And bitter taste, I had mentioned this already, this initial aversion we learn to actually um, get rid of um, and appreciate bitter substances, uh, hopefully not only beer, but also the healthy green vegetables that contain a lot of healthy, um, healthy um, ingredients. And we can learn uh, to get rid of this aversion and learn to appreciate that taste um, simply through exposure in our family. We learn our parents eat that, they are not gonna die from eating the peas. So me, we may try as well or eating the broccoli. So this just to give you a broad, um, um, introduction into what the sense of taste is actually uh, about. So here I'm going to present you four different studies uh, today. So all of them actually tackle a similar problem. So we do have um, different spaces or levels uh, that eventually lead to perception and action. So in the gustatory sense, we have a chemical space um, that is, for example, our sodium chloride or our common salt um, or sugar uh, uh, or citric acid. And this physical stimulus or chemical stimulus is actually coming in contact with our sensory organ, which is the tongue. And here it elicits a cascade of neuronal signals uh, that eventually is processed in different um, parts of the brain. And that is our neural or neuronal space or uh, step of the processing. After this processing of the sensory stimulus, uh, our brain or our minds are actually interpreting uh, the stimulus. They are making sense of it. Because what is very important to understand is that what we call perception is really not the mirror image of what is out there in the physical world. It's maybe an approximation if we are lucky, uh, but it can be also grossly misleading because our brains have lots of memory, we have stored lots of experiences, we have expectations, we may be distracted. So many, many factors in our mind actually influence at um, the perceptual experience that we are having when coming in contact with a physical or chemical stimulus. And depending on this interpretation, uh, our perceptual interpretation, we may take action, like take another bite or spit it out or avoid the food next time altogether. So my research has been focusing uh, largely on understanding how the brain activity may actually also reflect what is outside uh, in the chemical world, what defines our stimulus material, because obviously whether we taste or experience something salty or sweet and also the concentration of it depends on our actions, right? It's physiologically and also homeostatically so relevant. So there should be good discrimination in our brain between the different tastes and also the level of the concentrations that they are available in our nutrition. So in order to even get this project started, we had to overcome many, many hurdles, uh, mostly in technical nature. So you can probably imagine when we have um, a beverage um, or some kind of solution with the taste, um, I mean, we cannot just pour that into somebody's mouth or have them just uh, take a big sip while we monitor brain activity. So particularly when you're interested also really in a, in a nicely temporal resolution, you would want to use um, electrophysiological measures um, like you can see here in this picture where the person is wearing a cap with electrodes mounted into to pick up the uh, electrical brain activity through an EG um, amplifier. So we have to think of a stimulation that can actually be controlled. 
uh, because when you just take a sip, how do you control the time of the stimulus? How do you control the amount, the motions, et cetera? And think of doing this for a couple of hours. Participants may actually feel pretty full and don't want to continue uh, the experiments. So we are using a somewhat peculiar stimulation. So, and the protocol is as follows. So to the very left, you see um, a precision gastometer. It's basically a very fancy syringe pump system. So it has a series of syringe pumps. Each of them are connected to bottles, which hold a taste a solution. And they have another uh, valve uh, that lets uh, the syringe dispense the solution into this big blue hose to our participant. And along the way, uh, we have the individual tubes in a, in a warm water bath so that we can keep the um, temperature constant and near body temperature because we don't want to investigate the brain's responses to temperature cues. So once the stimulus or once the hose arrives at the mouth of the participant, it's actually eliciting very regular spray pulses. So we basically mix a solution with uh, high pressured, uh, pressurized air to get an aerosol. And we spray that stimulus onto the tongue with a very regular uh, rhythm. And uh, this regular rhythm has the beauty that it basically elicits no touch response after very few uh, spray pulses because this is really a culprit with taste stimulation. Uh, when I put a drop on the tongue, it's eliciting a touch response. I can feel it touch my tongue and our somatosensory system will fire and it will give a response, but I wanna study the taste response. So how, how can I disentangle that? So I silenced the somatosensory system on the tongue by applying this regular pulse. So literally the tongue feels numb. And after a few pulses, I can start introducing um, a taste stimulus. So I have a tasteless liquid, which is indicated here in black, and then a taste stimulus is embedded in this sequence in blue. Um, this really has uh, serves several purposes. I have the ability to control my stimulus exactly in time because uh, this pump is super precise and I know exactly when the stimulus is expelled. And also I can measure when it hits uh, the tongue. And it's also uh, spatially precise in a way that if I use a divider around the tongue, like really like a, just a physical barrier, we can have even lateralized stimulation. We can keep the constant uh, temperature. And because we just spray it into the tongue so people do not need to swallow because in order to be sprayed on the tongue, they protrude the tongue a little bit. Um, they don't need to swallow, which does not give us those horrible artifacts that you see here in black in this um, EG trace. And it's really unimodal because we silence the somatosensory system. And this technique has really um, made a big difference for us and allowed us to actually investigate what I'm showing you now. So the signal that you may get from such a stimulation uh, is shown here in an exemplary participant. So on the um, x-axis, you always see the time axis and time point zero is always the presentation of the stimulus. And on the y-axis here, you see amplitude uh, with positive going upwards. And each colored trace is um, the average of a few repetitions of a given uh, taste solution, for example, the blue trace is a salty taste um, at an exemplary electrode um, over the vertex. So and you can see here already that a lot of stuff is going on. There's a lot of latency differences, amplitude differences, differences between the tastes, right? And this is only one electrode and one participant. So we record from many electrodes and many participants over many trials. So we really have multidimensional data. And the fact that there's literally nothing in the literature actually telling us where to look in the 
data, uh, standard hypothesis driven um, uh, frequentist analysis is really not doing it. So we resorted, um, so, so here you can also see it summarized over uh, 18 participants. Um, it looks uh, a little bit uh, tidier here, but still it's very hard to actually decide which condition you wanna compare at which time point, et cetera. So we resorted to, um, to a multivariate pattern analysis. And uh, for this, we take the signal from 64 channels that we recorded, um, all the time points that we recorded in uh, 1.5 uh, seconds. Uh, we sampled with 500 hertz, so it's quite a few time points. And we basically use about 90% of the data to train a classifier to discriminate uh, between our uh, different tests that we presented. And after this learning uh, period, uh, we take 10% um, of the remaining, uh, so the remaining data um, for actually testing and see whether there is some kind of pattern, some kind of logic that may not be visible to the uh, bare eye in order to tell what taste has been presented to our participants. So the first question that I had mentioned at the beginning, do those neuronal response patterns contain any specific information for the different tastes? I call them large scale neuronal responses because we don't know exactly where they're coming from because we are picking up the entire brain here. So in order to do this, we presented a salty, sour, bitter, and sweet taste solution uh, to our participants in random order, many repetitions, many hours. And participants would receive a taste for 900 milliseconds, and then they would be given a pause before they had to say which, which taste they actually tasted. And we asked the classifier the exact same question. So which taste of the four possibilities is it actually? And what you see here is decoding accuracy on the y-axis and again, time on the x-axis. And you see here in dark gray, the average decoding accuracy in a sample of 16 participants. And what is actually apparent is that we have above chance decoding starting within 175 milliseconds after taste presentation. Uh, that means within the EG signal, we do have information about the taste quality uh, within uh, this time period. And you see a, coding, a decoding accuracy stays up uh, way above a chance. So this information remains available over, over seconds. So this was actually a very surprising finding. Um, First of all, because it's super early, it's super fast before people thought taste would be a very slow sensory system and it would take hundreds of seconds for us to even recognize the taste and respond to it. And uh, here we see now it's actually pretty fast and it's actually corresponding to the earliest uh, time point where we also see a rise in global field power or electric field uh, current uh, to the taste stimulus. So as soon as we taste basically something, it seems like the brain has the information about what, what it is that we are tasting. So importantly, because the tastes differ in their hedonic value and their pleasantness, but also in their intensity, it's, it's impossible to match all of those factors. We looked whether uh, intensity shown to the left here and pleasantness uh, now it's the other way, intensity on the right, pleasantness on the left, actually correlated with uh, decoding performance and it did not. So we think it's really not a misalignment, but it's really representing taste quality. But we noticed something else in the data. So here I show you a behavioral confusion matrix. And at the bottom, you read the taste uh, that was presented. And at the y-axis, you see the taste that was reported by participants. 
And what is actually um, apparent is that when a sour stimulus was presented in some instances, participants said it was salty. And when a salty stimulus was presented, participants sometimes said it is sour. So they seem to be not quite clear about the difference between the two. And we wondered, well, if they make this confusion, then this should be also mirrored at the brain level. And this is what we looked at. So we now actually trained a binary classifier asking is it taste uh, one or taste two? And when we compare sour with salty responses, we see no significant decoding uh, performance here. So the brain sickle also is uncertain about what it has been tasted. Just to give you another example, if we contrast a salty with a sweet taste, performance is doing pretty well. So it's not the binary classifier by itself. So here we have a very nice correspondence and link between the taste-related decision-making that participants really do and the value, the predictive value that we can take from those brain response patterns. So basically, if we had looked at the brain before, we may have been able to predict uh, those wrong um, or faulty behaviors. To confirm this further, we correlated those behavioral confusion matrices with the neuronal confusion matrices over time. And it looks pretty much like the first graph you saw where, sorry, where we have, again, um, a significant uh, correlation starting within 175 milliseconds between those two which is again confirming what I just said and also indicating that what we measure in the brain is really already reflecting the perception, the interpretation of the chemical stimulus, but not the chemical stimulus by itself. So it's a neuronal perceptual mapping, not a chemical perceptual, uh, not, not a chemical neuronal mapping. Mm -hmm. So let me sum this up for you. So large-scale neuronal response patterns co-test quality. I hope I could convince you of that. And this happens at the earliest level of the central taste processing cascade that we have been able to measure at the uh, scalp level. So it's basically super fast. It reflects a neuronal perceptual rather than a neuronal chemical mapping. So it reflects what you think you taste, not what you actually tasted. So with that, uh, we went on to actually ask whether those neuronal patterns predict also the speed at which a decision uh, can be made about a taste. And we, we got inspired um, to ask this question because reaction times and independently neuronal latencies for taste have been shown to vary between the different tastes. So we thought there could be really a link. It could be the informative aspect in the pattern that the classifier used. So we used a very similar <clears throat> paradigm like the one I showed you before, but this time the task was to press a button as soon as they tasted anything. So as soon as the taste was presented, they were allowed to push a button and we would remeasure the latencies to, it took them uh, to do so. So here you just uh, see the raw data and it looks pretty similar like in the previous study, a lot of latency and amplitude differences between the different tastes. And, um, and when we actually look at decoding accuracy for the uh, four tastes uh, that is shown here in blue, uh, we, um, we see that we have an onset that is a little bit earlier than uh, what we had seen before. Namely, it starts at 130 milliseconds. And I have plotted here the red curve, which is basically the data from the previous study, which is a different group of participants also, where they did not have to make a speed of decision. They could take their time to decide what they tasted. And you see the latency is a little bit shifted. So it's like 40 milliseconds. It does not seem much, but it's a lot for the brain. So there seems to be some task dependency also on the speed of brain processes and when this taste information actually becomes available. So, but let's look at the link between the response times and the, um, 
the, the, the brain information about the taste. So here, what you see at the, on the left side is again, uh, time plotted against decoding accuracy. And um, here now we have added the time point uh, at which participants push the button. So this is indicated by the um, vertical dashed black line. And in contrast, you see also the, the blue dashed line, and that is simply cutoffs that we set um, um, based on our single trials when decoding accuracy actually reached significance um, in, in each subject. And you see there's a gap in between them. That is not surprising. One would think information is first available in the brain before a person is able to act upon it. Also, once information is available, you need a bit of time to actually elicit that response to push the button. So this was expected. However, when correlating uh, the reaction times uh, with the onset of decoding accuracy, uh, we found a positive correlation. I think the plot is not the best. We were actually forced by the reviewer to have an aligned uh, time scale, so it's all like cluttered in one spot, but it's highly significant. And this is for the salty taste, but we can do this for all four tastes, and the patterns actually look pretty similar. We find a nice alignment of the link between the onset of the decoding accuracy and the uh, uh, response time of our participants. So actually the timing, and I should say those data were taken at a single trial level. So we would also always compare within a trial the onset of decoding and the given response belonging to this very trial. So the timing of neural taste presentation representation predicts the behavioral response times. And again, we looked whether the experienced taste intensity or the play taste pleasantness played any role, and we could not find any um, correlation here between this decoding onset times and those uh, pleasantness or intensity ratings. So what does this add to what we just learned before? So those large-scale response patterns, uh, they predict also taste-related behavior, and that in a goal-dependent manner. So what I mean with that is that it is task-specific. So if you're forced to give a speeded, a fast response, your brain will also have the information faster available for you to help you do this decision. So it definitely drives your decisions. So let's then look at what I said at the very beginning, where I said, like, it seems like as, as soon as you taste something, you know what it is, right? That, what the, that is what the first um, analysis suggested. But is that really the case? In order to answer this, we derived a somewhat um, more complex experiment. So we had two different experiments um, um, intertwined. In the first part of the, or in one part of the experiment, participants had to make a detection uh, decision. So they were either given water or a taste, and their decision was to basically push a button, which it was. And the second task was a discrimination task. So they were given either of two tastes on each trial, and they had to say which taste it was, for example, sour or salty, or sweet and bitter. Those two could occur um, in combination. And they were allowed to push the button as soon as they wished, or as soon as they could better. So they were instructed to uh, go full speed ahead. So here's the behavioral data. So when we look at the salty-sour pair, which we looked at together, and you remember people tend to confuse the two, what we see is in the detection task here shown by the blue bars, uh, participants were much faster than in the discrimination task shown in the gray bars. 
That is not a surprise given the cognitive load. So in the detection task, they had to um, actually just say, is it water or a taste? Whatever taste it was, it's not a difficult um, ask. While in the discrimination task, they really had to think about which taste it could be. So let's look at the brain level. So here we have again decoding onset latency, the, the earliest part where we have information about which of the tastes it is. And again, in the detection, we see it's much faster, um, starts like at 120 milliseconds, than it is in the discrimination task. So, and this is not an error in plotting, it's not the same data, it's really behavior on one side and brain activity on the other. So, but we had also a different condition, you know, the sweet bitter comparison. And there we see a completely different picture. Detection and discrimination latency behaviorally does not make a difference. It does not matter whether you discriminate or whether you detect sweet amongst water or whether you discriminate it against bitter. That, that was surprising. And look at the brain data. The exact same pattern of results, no latency difference whatsoever. So here you can see it all. So what that tells us is that there are some taste specific sequential, but also parallel processing of gustatory information, uh, which is highly taste dependent. So let us look at the differences also between those tasks uh, to between discrimination and detection to, to highlight that a bit further. So here you see uh, the response times versus the uh, onset of decoding times in those uh, correlation plots for the four different tastes. And um, you really see that the detection precedes the discrimination is shorter and faster um, only in the salty and sour conditions, but not in the case of sweet and bitter. That is not a surprise, right? From the graphs, we would have um, expected that those data uh, points cluster around zero for sweet and bitter. So here the idea is that detection does precede discrimination. However, if hedonic processing comes at play, comes to the table, that may facilitate discrimination as a parallel process. What do I mean with that? Sweet and bitter, we learned it's very pleasant or very unpleasant. So sour and salty does not have a pleasantness difference in our experiments, but sweet, no matter the concentration, people are going to love it and bitter, they're not going to like in the experiment. So here it's not only about um, taste perception, but it's really about liking and pleasure. And we believe that those processes, those hedonic processes kind of run in parallel and speed up the overall response time. That has been recently shown in an animal study. So, well, to my question, as soon as you taste it, you know what it is? Yeah, but only if it's sweet and bitter. So for um, stimuli that have no particular hedonic value, like sour and salty, this is not the case. So, Detection and discrimination, they operate sequentially, but also in parallel, depending on the taste quality. And that sums it up to actually being a bit more complicated than we thought, and that we are actually really able to explain. So, but together the data, I think, provide nice, uh, nice amount of evidence that there's a flexible and a goal or task dependent, but also taste specific link between what we see at the brain level and what can be predicted from it about uh, human behavior. And with that, I would like to move on to the last experiment um, that is not so much about behavior, but about individual differences. And that is really an important aspect in gustatory processing. 
Um, because it's a question that has been raised a lot, because I showed you at the beginning that we can learn to appreciate things or maybe also unlearn to appreciate salt with the dietary change. So one obvious question uh, always is whether the taste processing and lean and obese individuals uh, differ, um, kind of also with the assumption that their dietary patterns differ in a way. So what did we do to study that? So we had a manipulation of two different tastes. So we had a salty taste and a sweet taste that we presented at two different concentrations. So we did not present those images. Those are just illustrations. And we had a control condition which contained uh, two color, uh, two um, squares of two different colors and two different sizes. And the size and concentration manipulation basically also modulates the sensory evidence. So a small concentration or a small size square also means there's little sensory evidence and if it's larger, there is more available. With that design, we tested um, 30 lean and 25 obese uh, individuals using our typical taste stimulation protocol. And here is the results. Again, we have decoding accuracy plotted here against time. And the blue curve represents the lean group and the red curve represents uh, the average of the obese individuals. And the classifier uh, was basically um, decoding taste and answering the question, is it sweet or is it salty? And what we see is that early on, um, taste information emerges evenly rapidly in both groups and it does not uh, differ um, at all. That was a surprise because some people said that um, um, obese may actually experience the taste early on already differently. However, what is striking is this very late difference. So after one second of processing, this is very late uh, in perception um, uh, terms. So here we have... Um, um, a difference um, between the groups that indicates that obese participants lose this information about the difference between the tastes earlier than lean individuals do. Because remember, the curves reflect the, the coding accuracy between the two different tastes. So it looks almost like the taste information is fading from the obese brain. Importantly, when we do the very same analysis for our visual stimuli, classifying green versus blue, we do not find any group difference whatsoever. This is a very important thing to do because uh, whenever you compare different groups, there may be a lot of also physical differences, um, like the connectivity uh, at the skull level, uh, if you have a huge weight difference, for example. But that does not seem to be uh, the case here. And as a next step, we were wondering whether we can even go as far to classify the membership of the group. So basically here we're not classifying um, tastes anymore, but we're classifying people asking here for the different tastes plotted separately, whether we are having uh, looking at a brain response from a lean or an obese individual. And uh, what you can see here is particularly in this later time period that we saw where we saw the group differences. Here we also see significant um, decoding differences for the group membership. And again, when we look at the very same data, I just plotted it next to another, we do not see those group decoding at all when we look at the green or the blue uh, squares that we are presented. So it is really a differentiation of the neural representation of the taste but not the color stimuli that uh, allows us to differentiate between the individuals. And whenever you look at obese and lean individuals, one always have to take that with a grain of salt and be careful because 
there are a lot of very healthy um, um, overweight participants and we have uh, we don't have that information. So it is a very, very coarse categorization that we're doing here. And that requires quite some uh, more investigation also into their specific dietary habits. So what I would like to conclude from this is that those large scale patterns can differ between individuals. In our case, it was obese and lean. And so that indicates that there is some individual variable that may have something to do with the physical status, something to do with the behavior over the past years. But from our study, this is very hard to tell, and I don't want to um, really go there and make that statement. So it seems like we lost one result here in the slide. So um, I would not change the overall um, conclusion from that and hope I could show you with the series of studies that we do have evidence for a flexible, a task dependent and taste specific link between taste related behavior and the brain response patterns. And here they come. And with that, I would like to thank uh, the people who did most of the work. Uh, my students, Raphael Weiroth and um, Richard Hörschenberger and our technician, Andrea Kaczak, who did a lot of the work and my collaborator, uh, Nico Busch. And of course, also those uh, who gave us some money to run those studies. And with that, I thank you for your attention, for your patience, and I'm very much looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Very, uh, thank you very much, uh, Katrin. Um, so um, I think the, well, the question uh, session is op uh, opened. Uh, are there questions to this talk? At the moment, we don't have any in the chat. I see one hand. Uh, okay. Oops. Okay. Um, uh, I just want to ask because I just noticed that the classifiers are not doing like a really, really good job. And I was wondering if this is because you are looking at the whole brain. And my question is like, why don't, don't we know that there's some specific area for the test where you can focus and decode the neural data from there? It's just maybe a naive question, but... No, 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 it's a very important question. So what we are recording is a super noisy system. So we are recording, first of all, the entire brain while probably only a fraction of neurons are processing what we are interested in. And I mean, the participants are doing things, right? They're thinking about dinner plans. Maybe they just had a fight with somebody. Those thoughts are really making this very noisy. And um, it's a very obvious suggestion to just focus on one part of the brain where we think, you know, most of the processing is taking place. Um, however, this is hard to do with EG. It can be done uh, with fMRI. Uh, however, uh, there because you have a great spatial resolution, but no temporal information. If I were to use those EG data, I could make a source reconstruction and try to pinpoint where the data is coming from. But then with all the, um, the, the, the variables, right? I, I mean, I'm going to have so many uh, time points and then I'm going to add um, to my sensors, which are now 64, I'm going to add dimensions maybe to a couple of thousand um, points that define my source space, I would need so much data to do a meaningful decoding. And those experiments take already hours. Um, you would have to record for several days probably to do that, but I would love to. Okay, thank you. Uh, Wilhelm, will you ask your question? Yeah, I think it's related. Um, so the question is, um, so whether you, let's say, looked at the support of the classifiers more thoroughly. So what channels are, let's say, more active, more, let's say, where is the classifier, the distinction, uh, let's say, concentrated? And whether that changes in time, for example, um, 
and uh, this could be a hint, for example. And then a related question to that would be, um, do you see a distinction between these, let's say, kind of signals and, let's say, other cognitive uh, tasks, like if you look at EEG data and let's say uh, people are listening to music or something visual uh, stimuli or something like this. So is there some characteristic differences in the uh, EEG signals that you have observed? So your first question, if I got it right, so what we did was we would reduce the number of electrodes. Uh, we would look at one electrode, two, three, four, and we would just randomize this to have every possible combination of electrodes to, to maybe get rid of those who don't add information uh, to our analysis. That, that did not work at all. So as soon as you remove some, you lose even more of your decoding accuracy. Um, and your question, your second question. So when I, I, I originally came from vision science. So when I uh, recorded my first uh, test responses, I thought I, I programmed the experiment wrong because to me, it looked like a beautiful visual uh, evoked response, like the first um, uh, figure that I showed you. And so we have very prototypical um, uh, peaks and troughs uh, th that are closely related to a visual response, I would say, like an auditory response has, has much more smaller or somatosensory and faster responses. Um, that said, when we look at the uh, topographical distribution, like where on the scalp the signal is coming from, that's entirely different. But I think it's fair to say that um, the sensory systems share also properties in their evoked response in that they have a sequence of uh, peaks and troughs of different components. And I think it's also fair to say that those very early, the first components, whenever they occur, right, that varies from sense to sense, they reflect more sensory aspects that are closely linked to the physical or chemical nature of the stimulus, like the concentration, the size of an image, the loudness of a sound, for example, while the later aspects of this uh, signal reflect more cognitive aspects related to memory, related to evaluation. Do I like this? Can I name it? Things like that. And those components, they should be really universal across sensory systems because they are cognitive. Okay, are there more questions? I have a tiny one. At the beginning, when you described your uh, experiment, you said that you would like to uh, partition the tongue. Uh, why would you like to do that? <laughs> um, so partition sounds almost painful. Uh, so <laughs> I, I, so um, a crazy thing thing actually in gustation is that we don't really know where the fibers um, project to. So we know, for example, in somatosensory systems, uh, the input from the left side of the body is projected eventually to the right side of the brain and vice versa, right? We know this about hearing, we know how it works in vision, but we don't know how it works for, uh, for taste. So we don't know whether the fibers cross at which level the cr they cross and to which degree they cross because in visual, we also have just a partial crossing. So in order to investigate that, we needed to stimulate the tongue of the right, so the right side and the left side of the tongue separately because they are innervated by lateralized nerves. So, and with that, we could get a handle on where information may go. Hmm, okay. Okay. Ah. There's a question in the, in the chat. Um, Cheng Li said, uh, very nice work. Are there analogous experiments with more invasive recordings of trained primates who can distinguish taste? 
say, electrophysics recordings focused on gustatory and olfactory cortex? Not in recent decades. I think the last invasive recordings with primates were done in the 80s. So um, there are a few groups, I think in Tübingen, who do fMRI experiments on taste with uh, primates, but actually the animal model that is closest to the human is actually the mouse or the rat. So I'm typically relying really on rodent data because that gives us also the latest uh, data. And there we have uh, recordings from gustatory cortex, from primary gustatory cortex, where we see almost identical data of what we see here at the scalp label, uh, level, but with a better data quality because all this noise and also all this cognition that we have with the human uh, is so much lower um, when you have a direct measure uh, from a certain brain area. So, so there you would get the, the chemical space as well, um, or at least partially. Yeah, those questions are actually a little bit trickier to ask in an animal, uh, to, to actually answer in an animal, right? Because you can, you can look at behaviorally, you can look at approach and avoidance, and you can deduce if they continue to consume the sample, they must like it and they must recognize it's sugar. And if they um, do not continue to consume or even show an aversive behavioral response, they must have recognized it's bitter and it's aversive. Um, that's a bit of a stretch and, and a bit of a different quality of decision than asking a human which of the four tastes was it, right? Uh, so with humans, we can get much more precise and direct reports of what they experience. With animals, we don't get that. Okay, thank you. So if there are no more um, questions, um, I'll thank you again for the, for the very nice talk. Thank you for having me. Um, yes, like thank you. So, and, uh, I give over to Daniela. Thank you very much, Evelyn. I think I should give uh, just a few uh, final remarks. Uh, so may I ask all the members of the committee to switch on their camera, I think, while we do that. So effectively, you know, we want to thank all the speakers and all the mini symposium organizers for, uh, for just uh, uh, organizing such uh, engaging session in such a short time and with such, such a short notice. Um, at the end of uh, today's uh, conference, we're gonna uh, send uh, an email to request for feedback. And this is particularly important to us uh, we think it's important because it helps us making our conference better every year, but most importantly, it also can help us attract future funding. Uh, and uh, this would probably allow us to keep these conferences free of charge. So it, it, it is important and do spend some time in, in providing uh, feedback to us. And uh, speaking about uh, the future, we have a couple of exciting announcements to make. So first, uh, we have decided that ICMNS in 2022 will still be in a digital format online, similar to what we have uh, this year. Um, and uh, we are also planning for an ICMNS in physical, uh, you know, in, in, in a real conference in 2023 in, Le in Leipzig, which will be a joint meeting uh, with the CNS. Um, so we are very excited about that. Now, as you probably know, these conferences don't happen by themselves. Uh, and uh, we are actively asking everyone who wants to know more about organizing ICMNS and even get involved to drop us an email or to use the form uh, that we have linked in the booklet about the future of ICMNS. We should say that we already have received a positive injection of the fresh energies. And so if you stay tuned, you will find out more about it. But if you want to get involved, please, uh, please do send us an email. So we will continue communicating through the mailing list that we have, um, and we will keep you posted through that. At the moment, there is a debate about whether we should use our YouTube channel to put more content in there. Um, and if you have ideas or opinion about what content should be put in there, also write it in the feedback that you will receive this afternoon. 
And uh, I think the last things that remains to be done is to thank uh, FU Amsterdam, the University of Toulouse and Université Côte d'Azur that have provided the Zoom licenses for this event. And finally, I wish to thank all the members of the organizing committee. This uh, cannot be, it probably is best described by uh, uh, one of those relay race. <laughs> and I want to thank uh, all the members of the organizing committee, Peter Ashwin, Evelyn Bukwar, Gregory Fai, Eva Loscherbach, Wilhelm Stana, Etienne Tarré, and Peter Thomas for just uh, having passed the relay so many times during these uh, weeks. And the, fi the final thing I should say is that um, we had a, uh, uh, hiccup uh, in channel, on channel two uh, uh, during one of the last talks. And uh, we are trying to rescue this by letting the speaker of that session, Nadia Belmabruk, to give her talk here now. So if you want to stay a little bit longer, Nadia will have the chance to give the talk that was disrupted earlier on. So I'm just being told that Nadia and Christoph are now on channel one. So uh, may I ask Nadia and Christoph Puzar to just... Uh, unmute themselves, switch on their cameras and start yes. the session effectively for uh, the last talk of today. Thanks a lot, Daniel, for letting us having this prolongation. Uh, as you can, as you will see, that's, that's really long range interaction since it's, we, we try to start uh, more than an hour ago and hopefully we will manage to to have uh, the communication of uh, Nadia now. Uh, so so I've, I've asked Nadia to unmute and I will also ask her to start a video. Let's have another attempt. I'm, uh, Trying to do that. So it seems that it seems that Nadia still have some technical issues and can't yes. join us. I, I'm afraid that if the technical issues persist, the only thing that we can we can offer is to let perhaps Nadia give a talk at some point on yeah, the channel sure, I mean, and record record her content and put it there. Uh, I'm happy, you know. I'm sure that there will there will be an audience for that if we advertise it. I'm really sorry. Uh... Yeah. So one last attempt. Ask Nadia to unmute. Oh, this is uh, so frustrating. Okay, sorry. She, she wants yeah. me that she's not on channel one. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, Daniele, I suggest I reopen channel two. Okay. I can, there are less people, only the audience who want to hear Nadia talk come in okay. to channel two. I open it now and we decide in five minutes if okay. it's tough to try. Okay. So I will, uh, I'll certainly be there on channel two and I hope to find as many of you as possible. And uh, otherwise, thank you very much and uh, see you next year. Thanks. Goodbye, everyone.